Japan is changing its foreign policy strategy to unveil plans for its biggest military buildup since World War II. So they made this huge decision to toss off six decades of relative pacifism, increase their defense budget by double. In Japan's western flank now, um, Japan sees risk uh, and threat. Japan is going to increase its military budget by 26%. This is Japan's largest military budget increase since World War II. In 2023, Japan will spend around 6.8 trillion yen, or $55 billion, on its military. And Japan's Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, wants to make this budget even larger. He wants to double Japan's military spending up to 2% of its GDP by 2027. That's about $73 billion. This plan will make Japan the third biggest military spender in the world. It seems that Japan is turning its military around. For decades, Japan's military was purely for self-defense purposes. The Japanese army did this because it earned quite a reputation in East Asia, but now Japan has turned the ship around. It wants to develop a counter-strike capability. Japan wants its military to be able to fight a war. That's what the growing military budget is about. Japan wants to buy more ships, aircraft, ammunition, drones, and hypersonic missiles. It will develop a new sixth generation fighter jet together with the UK and Italy. To add some context, sixth generation fighter jets are the best in the world. Japan will also purchase tons of drones like the Turkish Bayraktar drone. In short, Japan will spend billions of dollars to upgrade their military. The question is, why? We can feel a rapid increase in the severity of the security environment around our country. In countries and the region surrounding our country, a strengthening of nuclear and missile capabilities, a rapid military buildup, and attempts to unilaterally change the status quo through power are becoming more pronounced. Before moving on, just a quick reminder to hit that like button below. YouTube has been restricting my videos a lot recently because of reports from CCP bots. So your like does help out this video massively in terms of the algorithm. All right, now back to topic. Japan's region is rapidly deteriorating. Countries from East Asia are building up their militaries and alliances. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida blames three countries for this. Russia, North Korea, and China. With Russia, well, it's obvious. When Russia invaded their neighbor Ukraine, Japan got a little worried. The fact that Ukraine is a neighbor of Russia's is important for Japan. You see, Japan neighbors Russia too. And surprise, surprise, the Russia-Japan border is disputed too. Russia and Japan both claim that they are the owners of the southernmost Kuril Islands. There had been conflicts between Japan and Russia, but in more recent years, this conflict has cooled down. There's no fighting between Russia and Japan, and it'll likely stay that way. Russia's war with Ukraine hasn't gone smoothly, to say the least. The war has been going on for 10 months. Russia's military has been underperforming Putin's expectations. It would be foolish for Russia to start another war on its eastern border. So Russia isn't Japan's biggest worry. Japan is probably more worried about another country that's close to them, North Korea. Because when you think of North Korea, you think of nuclear bombs. That's right. North Korea has launched a missile over Japan, sparking anger in Tokyo. North Korea has repeatedly flown missiles over Japan. This is terrifying for Japanese citizens. They know perfectly well what could be on those missiles. Nuclear warheads. Kim Jong-un has an estimated 40 nuclear bombs. That's nothing compared to the United States' 31,255 warheads, but 40 nuclear warheads are nothing to treat lightly. And Japan doesn't treat it lightly, as we can see from the massive budget increase. North Korea is definitely one of the reasons for developing a counter-strike capability. When Japan has hypersonic missiles of their own, Kim Jong-un will think twice before attacking them. But even North Korea 
isn't the biggest reason for this military spending increase. China is. China. 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 For the last 30 years, China's uh, military spending has increased drastically, at least 42-fold. Tensions have already been escalated very much by China. China is the largest threat to the security of Japan. I quote an official national security document here. It describes China as the greatest strategic challenge ever to securing the peace and stability of Japan. This is a huge change in attitude towards China. In 2013, Japan described China as a strategic partner, but a lot has changed since then. One chart can explain this, the military spending of China and Japan. You see, in 2013, the situation was a whole lot different. Japan's military spending was around $49 billion, while China's military was already on the rise with $164 billion in 2013. And this isn't even close to the current number. China's military budget is now close to $230 billion. Beijing has increased its military budget by around 7% every year. Meanwhile, Japan's budget has been shrinking. The Chinese military is now four times as big as that of Japan's, at least in numbers. But Japan will stay safe, right? There's no reason for China to attack Japan? Well, not quite. Japan's in a very dangerous situation. Taiwan wants to show that it's ready. Military jets uh, flying towards Taiwanese airspace. Taiwan is self-governing, but China sees this land as its own. Yes, we are prepared for, for every, to, deal, uh, to face every kind of challenge. The situation is getting worse, and we need to prepare for the worst possible scenario. Japan's dangerous situation has to do with Taiwan. China doesn't like the whole Taiwan situation. Xi Jinping wants Taiwan to be a province of the People's Republic of China. If Xi doesn't get what he wants, he could use his military. We all know that China is provoking Taiwan with military drills. China sends Navy ships and military aircraft over Taiwan's border all the time. In 2022, China sent 1,727 aircraft over the Taiwan Strait. While this is alarming for Taipei, it also causes a big headache for Tokyo. The first issue for Japan is its proximity to Taiwan. While Tokyo is around 1,300 miles from Taipei, some of Japan's territories lie much closer. These territories are called the Southwest Islands. This island chain is just miles away from the Taiwanese mainland. The island closest to Taiwan, Yonaguni, is just 100 miles away from Taipei. It goes without saying that these islands are located at a very strategic location, and Japan knows this. Japan has lots of military bases on these islands. Or, well, should I say the United States of America has lots of military bases on these islands. One island stands out, the Japanese Okinawa Island. This island hosts 32 U.S. military facilities. In fact, 70.6% of all the U.S. military land in Japan is located on this island. This is where things get tricky for Japan. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. The United States backs up Taiwan's independence. If China attacks Taiwan, we can't rule out U.S. military intervention. In other words, we can't rule out an all-out war in East Asia. This is where Japan's Southwest Islands come in. They house very important military bases. If the U.S. gets involved in these conflicts, these Japanese island bases will be very important. As a NATO ally, Japan would certainly back the U.S. up, so these bases on Okinawa will be crucial in a possible war. The thing is, Xi Jinping knows this. He knows that if he wants to attack Taiwan, he needs to prevent a U.S. counterattack from Japan. Long story short, it's possible that Japan could be dragged into this Taiwan conflict. On Japan unveiled a new national security strategy today, along with details of its biggest military buildup since World War II. That's what Japan is preparing for. 
It wants to prevent China from attacking its bases on the Southwest Islands. This is a huge reason for why Japan is spending billions of dollars on its military. Japan wants its military to be able to defend the islands. In order to do this, it needs to be able to strike China back at any moment. China won't drag Japan into the conflict if Japan can do this. For this counter-strike capability, well, you need an advanced and powerful military. So Japan has to break their purely self-defense policy to protect themselves from China's threat. But there's more to be discussed here. China and Japan are very similar to each other in a lot of ways. To understand that, we have to go back in history. The 50s marked a turn for the Japanese economy. It began to industrialize and it became a hub for the development of electronics, automobiles, steel, and other high-tech devices products soared and the economy skyrocketed in the 60s. It was dubbed the economic miracle. In the 1960s, Japan's economy was rapidly expanding. It grew by an average of 10% a year. In 1968, Japan's economy became the second largest economy in the world. Japan's economy continued to grow. In the 1980s, American media thought that Japan would overtake the United States as the biggest economy. At the time, it sure looked like it would. TVs, cars, computers, they were all being made by gigantic Japanese corporations. People started publishing books about how these corporations would take over the world. Japan's economic system was superior to that in the US. Until it wasn't. After the 1990s, Japan's economy stagnated. Did Japan take over the world with its superior economy? Nope. In 1976, right after the death of Chairman Mao, the economy was a wreck. The new leader of the People's Republic opened China up to the world, and bringing so much investments that they eventually turned China into a global factory. After Japan's economy stopped growing, a new East Asian giant emerged. China. The CCP's leader at the time, Deng Xiaoping, opened up China's doors to the world in new economic reforms. These economic reforms worked very well. China's economy grew by more than 10% a year. In 2010, China became the world's second largest economy. In recent years, the media has been catching up to this. China could overtake the US as the world's largest economy. The similarities start to show between China and Japan. The Japanese and the Chinese economic miracles are remarkably similar to each other and Japan's economic miracle failed. China's economic miracle could fail for the same reasons. There are a few reasons for Japan's economic downfall. It began with the lost decade. In 1991, a massive asset price bubble collapsed in Japan. Real estate and the stock market were priced insanely high. This had to do with huge quantitative easing, or money printing. The Japanese government was printing way too much money. This resulted in way too much money going into Japanese markets, and Japan was artificially creating a huge bubble. And, you know, bubbles have a tendency to burst. The Japanese bubble was no exception, as we can see on this chart. After a huge peak, the Japanese stock market index fell by more than 50%. More than 30 years later, the Japanese stock market still hasn't recovered. <laughs> now that's a big bubble. Whether China will experience such a bubble remains to be seen, but China is certainly not immune from such financial disasters. Just look at China's housing bubble last year. After the Chinese housing market crashed, the entire Chinese economy took a hit. But it's not only an asset bubble that caused Japan's economy to crash. Japan's economy still hasn't recovered from the lost decade. Much of this has to do with its population collapse. This can be explained with two charts. Since 1980, Japan's population increase has been slowing down, and during the last decade, its population has been declining. What's even more concerning is the average age in Japan. Japan's population has the highest median age in the world, with 48.6 years. This means that a huge part of the population is too old to work. Because Japan's population was too old, the Japanese economy could never recover from the lost decade. Now there happens to be another country with an aging population. China. China's population is aging faster than any other country in modern history. 
we can look at Japan and see what the effects of this are. An economic slowdown. You see, China's economy was powered on cheap labor and exports, just like Japan. But with an aging population, you don't have the people to pull that off anymore. And China's population is aging fast. Look at China's population under 40. Those are the people you need for your economy. But this population group is going to collapse in China. So Japan had a huge asset bubble and a population collapse. China has a housing bubble and a population collapse of its own. But there's one more similarity to be drawn. Competition. During Japan's economic miracle, Japan was the only developed economy in East Asia. But in the 1990s, Japan wasn't alone in this anymore. Meet the four Asian tigers. South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore had economic miracles of their own. This was good news for East Asia as a whole, but bad news for Japan. The industries that Japan dominated, such as electronics, now faced competition. And the four Asian tigers performed very well in these industries. Japan couldn't be the economic powerhouse of the world anymore, because these other countries took their market share away. Now back to China. China is currently the manufacturing hub of the world. It produces a whopping 28% of the world's manufacturing output. But the same could happen to China as Japan. There are a lot of other countries waiting in line to snap China's market share away. India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Vietnam, just to name a few. These countries all have one thing in common. Low production cost. Take India, for example. India has the lowest manufacturing cost in the world. This will be detrimental to China's manufacturing industry in the long term. If it's cheaper to manufacture in other countries, businesses will move away from China. Apple is already planning to move its manufacturing out of China. Again, we can look at Japan and see how this will play out. After it lost its dominance in its industries, its economy changed to a service-based economy. This took away a lot of the explosive growth it had when it was a manufacturing economy. The same will happen in China, too. Or rather, the same is happening in China, too. U.S. manufacturing orders in China fell by 40%. The move to the new Asian tigers is happening right now. It's inevitable that the Chinese economy will slow down, just like the Japanese economy did. But how is this related to Japanese military budgets, you ask? Well, when the Chinese economy slows down, it'll be the end of an era. When China stops growing, we'll see a geopolitical shift in East Asia. Much of China's power has to do with its economic growth and its huge population. But when you take those things away, the whole thing could collapse like a house of cards. Will it make the region safer? Perhaps it will. But on the other hand, a destabilized China could be more dangerous than it is now. An economic slowdown will debunk many of the reasons for President Xi Jinping's absolute power, if any. And a dictator losing his grip on power is pretty unpredictable. All Japan can do is prepare for the worst. This is China, the dragon of the East and the world's second largest economy. This is Japan the land of the rising sun, and the world's third largest economy. There is no love lost between these two powerhouses, and it might not be too wild of a statement to say that a brutal war in Asia might be an impending inevitability. There is the historical threat from China. Both nations have territorial disputes. Chinese government ships entered the Japanese waters. By 2027, Japan will have the third largest defense budget in the world. It's a very strong feeling in China that Japan is the enemy. China's massive military buildup in the Pacific. Japan is arming itself like it never has before. China and Japan have had squabbles and near incidents for years now. But it seems like the time for talk is nearing an end. In what has been a steep departure from its years of pacifism, Japan, at the beginning of this year, announced that it will double its military spending to 2% of GDP in the next five years. 
That is the nation's largest buildup since the Second World War. This action would make Japan the third largest military spender in the world behind only China and the USA. But what is Japan's reason for this drastic action? Well, China. Or in Japan's own words, China poses the greatest strategic challenge ever. This present moment seems to be the final tipping point in what has been a troubled 1,966 years of hostile coexistence. The big question is, where is this hostility rooted? In this video, I'll seek to explain the combative relationship between Japan and China, the history behind their relationship, what the future holds for these two East Asian powerhouses, and if indeed war is on the horizon. All right, before we jump into things, be sure to hit that like button below. It helps out a lot against the bots who try to dislike the video to kill its reach. Recently, the channel was mass reported for my coverage about the Russian war, which led to a big hit to the views. So your likes really help out a lot. Thank you. Sokoku is a Japanese term that roughly translates to closed country. In Japan, this word is one of great historical significance. It represents a simpler time a time of dynastic rule and noble lords, a time when samurai and arquebusiers had little need to defend the land, a time of peace and stability. For 215 years, the Tokugawa shogunate implemented Sakoku. This made Japan an isolationist state, uncorrupted by profane foreign cultures. Until one day, in 1854, when an American Commodore and 1,600 Marines arrived in Yokohama, to turn their world upside down. Of course, that's not completely true. Yes, Japan had been a quote-unquote closed country for about 215 years. But before that time, they had plenty of exposure to outside cultures. By the time Commodore Perry turned up in Tokyo, then called Edo, Japan had already built and destroyed close cultural bonds with a wide array of nations. Even so, Sakoku was no joke. During this time, nearly all Japanese commoners were forbidden from leaving the country. Likewise, only a scant few foreign nationals were ever allowed entry. While the Tokugawa shogunate allowed some trade with the Dutch and the Chinese, this was sorely restricted. And yet, despite the shogunate's best efforts, people across Japan took a great interest in what they called Dutch studies, a catch-all term for European engineering, medicine, and military science. The demand for foreign writings eventually grew so great that the government was forced to lift the ban on outside publications in 1716. The shogunate would go on to fully embrace the study of Dutch texts, eventually creating an agency dedicated solely to translating these works for the Japanese public. Remember this, it'll be important later. There was one foreign land the Japanese elites respected above all others. China had culturally influenced the island nation since the year 645, when Emperor Koltoku wrote into law the Taika Reforms, a set of legal codes based around Chinese Confucian philosophy. The reforms, designed to centralize control in the hands of the emperor, were derived from a series of envoys who had been sent to China to study every aspect of their culture. These diplomats became proficient in Chinese writing systems and Chinese literature, studied Chinese diet and architecture, they even scrutinized the manifold religious traditions popular during the Tang Dynasty. These reforms quickly came to dominate Japanese governance and many core aspects of Japanese life. The role of women was restricted in Japan, just as it was in China. The land was reorganized into provinces and counties, just as it was in China. And a top-down system of governance was introduced with a system of administration and written law that replaced the patchwork of hereditary institutions once endowed with the power of governance. These changes would echo through Japanese history. Fast forward 1200 years to 1845, and Japanese students are still expected to learn Chinese and study the Chinese literary classics. And while foreigners from China were still restricted to the port of Nagasaki, they were the only nation granted the special privilege of a small residential district within the city. But even considering these special privileges, relations between Japan and China weren't exactly warm. Since the late 1670s, there was an active national learning movement presented within Japanese society. This intellectual crusade took the view that Japanese culture was inherently pure. It decried the overabundance of Chinese academia, 
advocating for a focus on the history of Japan and the Japanese imperial family. And, at its core, national learning sought the eradication of all so-called corrupting foreign influences. Chief among these foreign influences was, of course, Chinese culture. The movement focused heavily on the Japanese language and the structure of the nation's historical development. Taking a page out of the Neo-Confucianist book, these early Japanese nationals created the Dai Nihon Shi, or in English, the History of Great Japan. This prodigious work of Japanese history and pride, like many products of the national learning movement, was ironically based upon the Chinese model of intellectual nationalism. While the Chinese Empire emphasized the study of Chinese classical literature, the national learning sect attempted to draw focus towards the poetic works and feudal traditions of ancient Japan. Despite its occasionally derivative nature, the national learning movement's proponents eventually mounted a full-scale war against all foreign influences. This included an attempt to purge Japan of all Buddhist and Confucian institutions, a lofty task given that the Japanese state was run based on Confucian principles, and each Japanese citizen had to be registered at a Buddhist temple. Certainly, the national learning movement was not an immediate success, but its core tenets took root during the Tokugawa shogunate and steadily spread. During his reign from 1680 to 1709, Shogun Tokugawa Tsunayoshi made it a policy to encourage national learning among scholars of the era. He and members of his clan actively provided funding for the National Learning Scholarship. In 1728, nativist scholar Karuna Azumamoro established his National Learning Academy in Kyoto, where he emphasized the purity of the Japanese imperial dynasty and discouraged Buddhism and Confucianism as corroding influences, attracting many Shinto clergymen to his way of thinking. By 1746, one of his students, Kamono Mabuchi, was hired to lecture members of the ruling Tokugawa clan on ancient Japanese history. In 1760, Kamono Mabuchi became a wandering scholar. He traveled throughout Japan preaching a dualistic ideology, in which Japanese culture, with its more fluid grammatical structure, was representative of all that was good and natural, while Chinese culture, with its strict grammar and more structured writing, was the embodiment of the artificial, unnatural aspects of the human life. In 1765, Kamo no Mabuchi penned his seminal work called The Study of the Idea of Our Country. Published in 1806, decades after his death, the book took aim at the prevalence of Chinese learning which was so common in Japan. In this text, Kamo managed to encapsulate the core of the national learning philosophy. He argued that Chinese life was comprised of nothing but terror and suffering, owing to the periodic rise and fall of the many imperial dynasties. He juxtaposed this idea with the allegedly more consistent, more stable Japanese dynasty, which national learning scholars so adored. Thus, in this national learning movement, we can see the beginnings of the Japanese nationalism that would come to dominate, a set of ideas that held Japanese superiority, the purity of the unbroken imperial line, and a general distaste for Chinese society and culture at its core. It's February of 1854, and the United States Commodore Matthew C. Perry is sailing into Tokyo Bay for the second time. On his first trip, the Commodore approached the island nation with a fleet of four vessels and a letter from President Millard Fillmore requesting a treaty that would establish diplomatic relations and bonds of trade between the two countries. Today, he has returned after half a year, this time with nine ships in tow. By the end of March, he will have secured the signature of Emperor Kome on the Treaty of Kanagawa. Still favoring its long-time isolationism, the government of Japan was predictably displeased to find itself trapped between a rock and a hard place. Perry's expedition and the ensuing treaty left Japan feeling more vulnerable than ever. Only 12 years before the Kanagawa Treaty was signed, Japan had watched its neighbor to the west fall prey to the military might of the British Empire. The First Opium War was a massive defeat for Imperial China. Despite its wealth and grandeur, the powerful nation had failed to maintain its own sovereignty losing its right to ban opium imports and finding itself locked into a treaty that gave land, trade power, and significant legal authority over to the British. While Perry's treaty was not nearly as invasive as the one that the Chinese had been forced to sign, it was still viewed as an egregious usurpation of Japanese authority, 
1854 agreement established two minor ports where American naval steamships could refuel and stock up on supplies. It also protected American whalers, provided for the humane treatment of shipwrecked American seamen, and established an American consulate in the city of Shimoda. Above all, this meant one thing. Sakoku was dead. Isolation was over. And Japan, whether it liked it or not, was now part of the international community. By 1858, Japan had signed treaties with Britain, Russia, and France, as well as a second treaty with the United States. Altogether, the island nation was now trading with almost every foreign power that expressed interest in doing so. Furthermore, the nation had granted extraterritoriality to many foreign states, preventing the citizens of other nations from facing trial inside of Japan. The swift evaporation of their country's sovereignty left the people of Japan disillusioned and dissatisfied with the leadership of the Tokugawa shogunate. The nativist spark that national learning principles had been coaxing for decades was now ready to ignite. The military movement to overthrow the shogun and restore the imperial family to power began in 1866. The feudal domains in the south and west of Japan had long expressed dissatisfaction with the rule of the shogun. Despite their similar inclinations, they were trapped in a cycle of feuding interests which kept them forever divided. At long last, after the laundry list of unequal treaties had been signed, the clear encroachment of foreign powers forced these regions to unite. They could not have chosen a better time to coalesce. For the people of Japan, after centuries of isolation, were not well disposed towards the mass of outsiders whose trading vessels now gathered in their ports. Their rallying cry was Sono Joi, revere the emperor, expel the barbarians. On November 9, 1867, Tokugawa Yoshinobu willingly gave over his rights and privileges to the emperor. After 10 days, he resigned, and the office of the shogun was no more. The events that followed represent one of the swiftest periods of development in the great saga of human existence. This period is known to history as the Meiji Restoration. In 1867, Japan was a nation in crisis. The regime that had ruled Japanese society for centuries was out of power. The young Emperor Meiji, not yet in his 15th year of life, was now tasked with governing a country of 34 million. And Japan, feudal and underdeveloped, now seemed destined to meet the same fate as its neighbor to the West. And yet, by 1895, their fortunes had reversed. Japan found itself the most technologically developed and industrialized nation in Asia, with a military strong enough to face the very empires that had broken their isolation a mere 41 years ago. How? There are many factors that come together to explain the seemingly miraculous rise of the Japanese Empire. But before we discuss what Japan managed to achieve in its rapid rise to the top, we should identify the groundwork that made it possible. Despite its regressive political structure and intense isolation, Japan was a shockingly well-educated society. Samurai, the Japanese warrior class, quickly turned towards bureaucracy to make themselves useful during the country's two centuries of peace. These warriors and their children became local government officials, tasked with keeping records and enforcing the law. To give their samurai the necessary administrative skills, many daimyo, Japanese feudal lords, opened schools to educate their loyal retainers. Additionally, many of the common folk had money enough to send their children to Terakoya, a type of private school that taught basic reading and writing skills. Their population was also vastly more urbanized than one would expect for a nation whose economy was based largely on agriculture. This urbanization likely also owes its existence to the surplus wealth generated by avoiding violent conflict. With such a heavily literate population, it's no wonder fields like Dutch studies became so prominent in Japan. Though they did not immediately act on the knowledge they consumed, Members of Japanese society were still uncommonly well-informed on matters concerning the more developed portion of the globe. While their physical infrastructure lagged far behind Europe and the United States, the shogunate's governance may have actually managed to build a feudal population more inclined towards rapid reform and development than any other in the course of human history. With this ready foundation, Japan began its rise in 1868 when a council made up of military leaders who restored the emperor to power was formed. 
Most of these state counselors were ambitious young men from the lower rungs of the samurai. But what they lacked in experience, they made up for in skillful planning. The old feudal domains were abolished and replaced with the system of prefectures that is still used today. The old class of feudal lords gave up their land and power to become kazoku, noble peers of the realm, with seats in a chamber of parliament modeled after the British House of Lords. The samurai class was also abolished, and these warrior families became shizoku, a class between the commoners and nobility with no special privileges beyond a modest imperial stipend. In 1872, the local militias of noble houses were abolished and replaced by a unified standing military organized in the style of the great imperial powers of the age. A new system of conscription mandated three years of military service from all men of all classes. A unified command office was created in 1878 to coordinate naval and army actions. These joint chiefs of staff answered directly to the emperor and were given broad authority in matters of military planning. The spirit of loyalty and obedience that had once been the province of the samurai came to define the new, drastically enlarged, military class. Young men throughout Japan were transformed during their mandatory service. And when they went home, they carried the ideals of the armed forces and the old samurai's Bushido code back with them. The military found profound success, both as a defensive force and as a method of social transformation. The Japanese economy saw similar modernization. By 1880, all major cities were connected by telegraph lines. In 1882, a modern banking system was established in Japan and was paired with government programs to fund private industry. By 1872, Japan's first railway was constructed. By 1890, more than 2,000 kilometers of track had been laid. Japanese imports increased by $435 million, exports increased by $395 million, an average increase above 400% in just 34 years. Needless to say, industrialization was achieved. As Japan modernized and embraced its imperial vision, its eyes turned toward mainland East Asia. Korea had been a tributary state of imperial China since the mid-fourth century. But China had never exercised complete control over the country. Korea's tributary status was often ceremonial in nature leaving the peninsula with control over domestic affairs while they ceded authority over international matters to the dynasties of imperial China. But by the mid-19th century, China was in dire straits, having lost much of its own autonomy in the Opium Wars. Japan, on the other hand, was rising in the east and ready for imperial expansion. Now, Korea was a strategically important location for both China and Japan. The peninsula was a buffer zone between the two nations and would be supremely relevant in any conflict between the two states because of its potential to dramatically shorten supply lines. Instead of crossing the entire China Sea, the Japanese would only need to cross the much shorter Yellow Sea if a conflict arose. And for Japan, the economic potential of the Korean peninsula was too great to ignore. While Japan is comparatively lacking in natural resources, Korea is rich in iron and coal reserves. For a nation so eager to expand, the opportunity to improve military readiness was too great to ignore. As Japan, the rising star of the East, grew even stronger and China's dominance began to fade, conflict in Korea became inevitable. On September 20th, 1875, a group of Japanese sailors went ashore on Ganghua Island in Korea's coastal waters. The men, sent to request water and supplies, sparked a violent response from the local Korean military installations. The island's forts fired on the sailor's vessel. The Japanese ship, called the un -yo, responded with exceptional force. First by bombarding the island's military fortifications, then by landing on the island to set the locals' homes ablaze. In the end, the Koreans were left with 35 dead, 16 captured, and one fort destroyed all by a force of 22 Japanese sailors. Five months and six days later, the Treaty of Kongwa Island was signed. The agreement was not unlike the Treaty of Kanagawa, but this time Japan was the aggressor. Its provisions officially ended Korea's tributary relationship with China, opened three Korean ports to trade with Japan, and granted Japanese citizens extraterritoriality within Korea's borders. For the next eight years, China and Japan jockeyed for influence over the Korean people. 
While Japanese leaders supported Korean modernization efforts and defended reformers, China threw its lot in with conservative traditionalists, including the Korean monarchy. Tensions came to a head in 1884 when the Japan-backed Enlightenment Party of Korea attempted a coup d'etat against the China-backed monarchy. While the coup was a failure, it did result in a mutual agreement between China and Japan to withdraw all their troops from Korea. This brings us to the tipping point, the first great conflict in the modern era between Qing Dynasty China and the Empire of Japan, the first Sino-Japanese War. For a period of 10 years after the attempted coup, tensions had a chance to cool. That all changed in 1894, when Kim Ok-kyun, ok the pro-Japanese Korean leader of the failed uprising, was lured to Shanghai and murdered by Chinese forces. His body was taken back to Korea aboard a Chinese warship. There, his dismembered corpse was put on display in public as a warning to the pro-Japanese rebels. Unsurprisingly, the people of Japan saw this grotesque display as an inexcusable assault on Japanese national pride. China had just butchered a man whose entire life was dedicated to taking Korea down the same path of modernization that Japan was undertaking. Later that year, after the breakout of a peasant rebellion in Korea, Chinese officials sent troops over the border to help defuse the rebels. Already on edge, Japan saw this as a violation of their previous agreement to keep troops off the peninsula. Soon enough, 8,000 Japanese soldiers were marching on Korean soil to combat the 2,900 sent by China. Quickly, the rebels began to lay down their arms, encouraging all foreign warriors to leave the peninsula. The Korean king was similarly inclined and ordered all Chinese troops to leave his country in hopes this would mollify the Japanese. These efforts backfired. With a large military force on the ground and no Chinese soldiers to stop them, Japan marched into Seoul. They quickly captured the king and gave him the title of emperor to signify Korea's final and complete detachment from Imperial China. After this, China sent over 11,000 elite soldiers, the best troops they had to offer, aboard the Kaohsiung. But as the ship sailed across the Yellow Sea, it was destroyed by the Japanese Navy. As the ship and the soldiers sank, so too did the hopes of the Chinese people. Since the end of the Opium Wars, Imperial China had attempted to renovate its military, doing its best to modernize in the way Japan had. Their inferior weapons and tactics showed that their efforts had all been for naught. War was not declared until August 1, 1894. While the international community predicted China, with its vastly larger army, would attain an easy victory, the reality of Japanese modernization soon set in. The vastly superior Japanese forces were able to slash through the poorly funded Chinese navy and eviscerate the enemy nation's supply lines. After this, they cut off Chinese forces in northern Korea and encircled Pyongyang. On September 15th, Prince Yamagata Aritomo led Japanese armed forces as they converged on Pyongyang. The prince's 10,000 troops did battle with the 14,000 Chinese soldiers in and around the city. By the end of the day, 6,000 Chinese troops lay dead, missing, or injured, with only 568 casualties on the Japanese side. Overwhelmed, the Chinese left the city, falling back behind the border in hopes of defending the homeland. Little did they know, these efforts would also be in vain. Japanese forces managed to invade Manchuria, north of Beijing, and the province of Shandong, to the south of Beijing. They proceeded to fortify their control of all naval routes into the capital city. Quickly, the Japanese navy and army, from land and sea, managed to seize control of Port Arthur, a port city on a tiny peninsula between Korea and northeast China. It was there, on November 21st, 1894, the Japanese armed forces perpetrated the first in a long line of large-scale war crimes on Chinese soil. The massacre came after the discovery of several injured Japanese soldiers, men no longer fit for combat, who had been physically mutilated, burned, and killed by Chinese soldiers and bounty hunters. There is documentation of many Japanese troops, including Lieutenant Kijiro Nanbu, pledging to seek vengeance for what was done to their injured comrades. Though the city had been evacuated, there were still thousands of civilians remaining in Port Arthur when Japanese troops entered the city around 2 p.m. 
multiple reports of the events that transpired were set down in writing by Japanese soldiers. When the slaughter was done, an unknown number of corpses were left to rot. Within the city, at least 2,600 were killed, but the majority of the deaths occurred in the suburban hills surrounding Port Arthur. The massacre's total death count could be as high as 20,000. Upon seeing that their capital city was under threat from the north, south, and east, the Chinese sued for peace. What followed was the Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed in April of 1895. In this document, China recognized an independent Korea and made substantial territorial concessions. China gave up Taiwan and the 64 smaller surrounding islands that made up the Pescadores Archipelago. They even stooped so low as to give away the Liaodong Peninsula, the landmass upon which Port Arthur sat. In addition to the land concessions, China was expected to give Japan 17.6 million pounds of silver as war reparations, and granted Japan trading privileges within Chinese territory. The defeat China suffered was so severe that European nations saw additional opportunity to encroach on Chinese authority, causing a cascade effect that would trigger several revolutionary movements that would eventually see China's Qing Dynasty removed from power. China's Qing Dynasty came to power in the mid-1600s. For centuries, the regime faced violent conflict and rebellion from within their own borders. The ethnically Manchurian royal family encountered frequent conflicts with the majority Han Chinese population, and a variety of secret societies, religious sects, and ethnic minorities that existed inside their vast land empire. By the mid-1800s, the Opium Wars, severe corruption, poorly managed military affairs, and cascading natural disasters resulted in widespread famine, killing some 40 million. Needless to say, the Qing Dynasty was already primed for a total collapse, when, in 1850, a failed civil service student named Hong Chichuan started a rebellion by claiming to be the younger brother of Jesus Christ. For the next 14 years, he and his army of followers, mostly starving peasants from Guangxi province, led the most successful rebellion that the Qing Dynasty had ever faced. By the end of the rebellion in 1864, as many as 30 million people had died in the conflict. It was then that the Qing knew they f***ed up. Seeing a path to power, radical reformers rallied around the five-year-old emperor Tang Tzu in 1861. China's first ever foreign affairs office was founded, alongside state-funded schools teaching English and French. By 1865, the child emperor's government was manufacturing arms, and the nation's first naval blockade was constructed in 1866. A new naval fleet was commissioned and became the eighth largest in the world. In 1872, Chinese students were sent west to study in American universities and brought valuable knowledge home when they returned. And after using their modern weapons to finally defeat several ongoing rebellions, it looked like the Qing Dynasty might actually save itself from utter defeat. However, even as the government tried to change, a series of conservative forces held China back. While the study of modern science and technology was promoted, many young people had little faith in the new path being offered. Study of Confucian classics and passage of the standardized civil service exam was the only reliable route for those wishing to advance their own careers. The things taught in American and European universities were seen as valuable to the nation, but earned Chinese students little respect and even less job security. And though China had purchased a new fleet of ships from all across Europe, its navy was still clumsily managed. Their naval forces were essentially broken up into four separate fleets, each functioning in its own region with little to no coordination. The partially modernized army suffered from a similar lack of centralized leadership. Troops were often conscripted and trained at the local level, leaving China's army broken up into several smaller fighting forces, each led by a different high-ranking imperial official. In 1873, the 17-year-old Emperor Tang Tzu was put in direct control of the government, despite his age. This move showcased a core flaw in the Qing Dynasty's modernization movement, namely their complete unwillingness to emulate new modes of governance. Without the more consultative, merit-based forms of government that dominated more powerful nations, China struggled to construct a resilient society. Rampant corruption and institutional malaise proved too great a challenge. In 
even for the most ardent reformers. Needless to say, the self-strengthening movement was a failure. Except the Tongzhi reforms weren't Imperial China's only attempt at reform. After Tongzhi's death in 1875, the Guangxi Emperor ascended to the throne. And while he spent his first 24 years in the office only nominally ruling while his aunt, the Dowager Empress Sashi, governed, he did have a brief nine-year window of power beginning in 1889. Following China's embarrassing defeat in the Sino-Japanese War, a panoply of groups across the country began advocating for modernization. Intellectuals across China began to publish works arguing for various paths to reform. And in 1898, during his aunt's semi-retirement, the Guangxu Emperor began to accede to the requests of certain moderate reformers. On the 11th of June, the Emperor issued his first reform decree in which he asked the people of China to study foreign subjects like medicine and engineering. Shortly after, the Emperor began to speed up reforms, moderating himself less and less. In total, 40 separate imperial commands aimed at modernization were written into law. The Confucian civil service was to be dismantled and replaced with a national system of universities and lower secondary and primary schools. Modernized systems of commerce, medical education, and scientific research were adopted. Advanced industry was promoted. The nation's law codes, the civil administration, and the military were all reworked to emulate European, Japanese, and American systems of organization. Though inspiring, the emperor's reforms didn't last. The very same year they were written into law, in 1898, the old guard of imperial China began to chaff under Guangxu's reforms. Corrupt military leaders, local governors, and Confucian civil administrators felt power slipping through their fingers. These forces quickly rallied around the more conservative Dowager Empress Sashi. Forced out of retirement, the Dowager carried out a coup d'etat and restored herself to power. Though two important imperial advisors escaped to Japan, at least six of the emperor's reform-oriented staff were executed. Guangxu was imprisoned in his palace, rather than being killed. The people of China, left frustrated with government inertia and despondent over the barrage of foreign attacks, found hope in a wide array of political movements and secret societies. Chief among them was, and I'm not joking, the Society for Righteous and Harmonious Fists, more commonly known as the Boxer Movement. The Boxers were a complex group with a fascinating array of beliefs. But at their core, the movement had one goal to rid China of all they considered foreign influence. The movement began in the 1890s in northern China, and originally was dedicated to overthrow the Qing dynasty. However, as time passed and their membership rosters expanded, the boxers grew increasingly focused on the foreign powers that had come to dominate key spheres within Chinese society. The boxers were most prevalent in Shandong province, just south of the capital Beijing. In this province, poverty had grown relentlessly after years of war, drought, and famine. To make matters worse, unemployed youth turned to banditry en masse to survive, worsening conditions in the region. Chinese Christian converts became a lightning rod for peasant resentment. The faith became a shield for many bandits because of its official protection under imperial law, owing to various treaties signed with European powers. Many converts were able to avoid punishment with impunity. Meanwhile, in Beijing, Dowager Empress Sushi was looking for a way to combat foreign influence. Despite their anti-Qing origins, imperial conservatives largely saw the boxers as a useful tool to combat foreign powers. After a brief skirmish between the two factions, agents of Sushi convinced the group to abandon their opposition to her government and instead support the Qing in destroying the foreigners. After this, the governor of Shandong began to employ boxer bands as local militias. In late 1899, boxer gangs began openly assaulting Christian missionaries and their local Chinese followers. These boxer forces began to march north, distributing anti-Christian propaganda to local peasants. As the march went on, the boxers burned foreign-built buildings, tore down churches, and slaughtered groups of foreigners and predominantly Chinese Christians. In May of 1900, the boxers had come to surround the rural areas near Beijing. The city of Beijing housed a population of over 1 million, with a significant number of foreigners in the International Legations Quarter, 
The legation's fearful residents and the actual diplomats who live there began to contact their nations for help. In June of 1900, the foreign powers responded to the boxer mobs with an eight-nation alliance. A force of 2,100 marines and sailors began to journey towards Beijing. Before they could arrive, thousands of boxers flooded the city of Beijing and began a mass killing of Chinese Christians. A population of 3,000 Chinese civilians found refuge within the walls of the legation's quarter. On June 11th, Japanese ambassador Sugiyami Akira was assassinated by boxer troops when he tried to leave the city to meet the incoming relief force. On the 17th of June, a second legion of the Eight Nation Alliance seized control of the coastal Daegu forts. The next day, Dowager Empress Cixi ordered the indiscriminate killing of all foreigners within the country. The terrified residents of the legation's quarter found themselves besieged. Having received word of the Boxer Rebellion, the Eight Nation Alliance swiftly assembled a force of 19,000 troops, more than 40% of which came from Japan. On the 14th of August, the massive force took control of Beijing, ending the eight-week-long siege of the legation quarter. After much negotiation, in September of 1901, the Boxer Protocol was signed, mandating $330 million in reparations be paid to the Eight Nation Alliance, an indemnity far smaller than what the Japanese initially requested. Despite initial Japanese opposition, American diplomats persuaded the alliance to abstain from seizing larger pieces of Chinese territory. Instead, they were convinced to embrace the open-door policy, concocted by U.S. Secretary of State John Hay, which mandated Qing territorial integrity be protected, leaving China open to equal investing and trade with all powers. From 1904 to 1905, the people of Japan fought and won a war with the Russian Empire. The historic victory showcased the extent of Japanese power in East Asia. The war saw Manchuria, the enormous northern homeland of the Qing, placed under Japanese control. What's more, after losses to European powers following the First Sino-Japanese War, Japan had successfully regained control of the Liaodong Peninsula, where the city of Port Arthur sat. And perhaps the greatest prize of all, Korea was now firmly under Japanese control. Unsatisfied with the open-door policy, from 1905 to 1907, Japan sought greater territorial control in China. Having taken control of Taiwan in 1895, the Japanese Empire saw the nearby province of Fujian as the ideal place for expansion. However, at this time they were also trying to obtain loans from France, which supported the open-door policy. The French, fearful of territorial conflict, bound Japan to the policy as a condition of their financial agreement. In 1907, the Japanese forced the abdication of Gojong, the Korean monarch. After his departure, the monarchy was removed from power and an extensive campaign of Japanese domination began in the country. In 1910, Japan officially annexed Korea, beginning a manifold effort to forcibly integrate Korea with Japan. A web of Japanese military forces, business interests, and Meiji-era officials seized control of the education system, the police, land ownership, and other key aspects of Korean life. Japanese settlers and businesses, interested in agriculture, were given land that had been seized from Korean peasants. Those same peasants were forced to perform days of compulsory labor and paid exorbitant taxes to fund large-scale irrigation projects. In schools, Korean language and history were suppressed while the Japanese language was promoted. These abuses would continue in Korea for the next 35 years. Perhaps chastened by the disastrous Boxer Rebellion, Qing officials seemed to experience a brief period of lucidity. From 1901 to 1911, Cixi and the imperial court implemented several last-ditch reforms attempting, once again, to modernize their country. In 1901, the administrative office was established with a board of five well-respected statesmen responsible for overseeing all reforms. The office resolved to institute political reforms that would transform China into a constitutional monarchy over the course of 12 years. In 1906, the process began, and by 1909, China was holding actual parliamentary elections and elections for regional provincial assemblies. From 1902 to 1907, provincial administration was partially reformed. These changes saw the financial and military power of local governors dramatically reduced and modern policing practices established. In 1901, an Office of Foreign Affairs was formed, 
In 1905, the imperial examination system of the Confucian classics was abolished, and modernized academics were established in every province to replace it. Tax collection was largely standardized across the country, and new, simplified law codes were established. Reforms made to the military were of similar significance. 1901 saw the founding of a new training system for imperial army and naval officers, as well as the establishment of three well-stocked arsenals in major cities. In 1903, military readiness was partially addressed with the creation of the Central Training Command. The largest regional army, based in Beiyang, was turned into the new National Army. A lengthy plan to reorganize the army was published in 1904. The report included plans to increase pay, thereby reducing corruption amongst the enlisted men, as well as plans to observe provincial officials to ensure central decrees were enforced at the local level and plans to assign non-commissioned officer positions to literate soldiers with sufficient expertise. But just as these new directives were implemented, a movement was brewing. Millions of Chinese citizens throughout America, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and other nations began to organize. In 1894, a Chinese-born resident of Hawaii named Sun Yat-sen founded the Revive China Society. The organization, largely populated with Chinese expatriates, was dedicated to fomenting revolution against the Qing. Having received substantial donations from supporters, Sun returned to his homeland intent on sparking an uprising. His plot failed miserably, and the revolutionary went into exile. But by 1897, Sun had attained great notoriety as the face of Chinese revolution. That year, he moved to Japan and forged close bonds with supporters of the Pan-Asianism movement. In addition to asylum, he eventually began receiving political and financial backing from the Japanese. With the covert support of a powerful nation, Sun Yat-sen's influence began to grow. In 1898, popular Chinese reformist Liang Qichao fled to Japan and established a Chinese publishing outlet. Liang's propaganda, which argued for revolution, was an enormous success. Using Japan as their base of operations, Sun and Liang began to win converts at an exponential rate. In Tokyo in 1905, Sun became the head of the United League, a revolutionary coalition. With chapters across America, Japan, and Europe, the group was particularly attractive to Chinese students studying abroad, making their membership unusually well-educated. But after supporting 12 failed revolts in mainland China, Sun and other revolutionaries began to feel the heat of Qing oppression, even from their hiding places abroad. In 1907, the Japanese government pulled their support for Sun and asked him to leave the country. Unbowed, Sun used his celebrity to fuel a tour across Europe and the United States. As the Qing declined and the propaganda continued to flow, the cause of revolution gained increasing support. In October of 1911, in southern China, the movement for revolution finally caught fire. The Qing, unable to contain the spread, began negotiating for a constitutional monarchy. However, even this concession could not stop the numerous provinces from declaring their support for Sun Yat-sen's revolutionary coalition. Sun quickly left the United States and headed for Europe, where he ensured neither the British nor the French would give aid to the failing Qing. This latest attempt at revolution was indeed a great success and liberal reformers began the work of establishing a Chinese republic. The new government based itself in Nanjing. Though initially elected as provisional president by the National Assembly, Sun Yat-sen resigned the office, giving it up to Yuan Shikai, the most powerful military leader of the Qing forces, in exchange for an alliance to secure the new republic. However, despite their rapid rise, the new Republic of China was not as secure as many assumed. President Yuan largely ruled using military force alone and ignored the provisional constitution that the National Assembly put in place. Dissatisfied with his leadership, provinces began to declare independence. Warlord states sprung up and chaos began to spread. When thinking of the First World War, most minds reasonably turned to Europe. But the Asian sphere, though less central to the conflict itself, was still the backdrop for a massive expansion of Japanese influence over China. In 1914, when the war broke out, Japan saw great opportunity. Having signed a treaty with the British Empire in 1902, 
The Japanese were well-placed to join the Allies and fight the Germans in the Pacific. Since 1898, Germany had controlled the city of Qingdao in Shandong province. A joint Anglo-Japanese force, led by Japan, lay siege to the German-controlled region. By November of 1914, the Germans had surrendered, leaving much of Shandong in Japanese hands. The events that followed are known to history as the 21 Demands, a Japanese attempt to diplomatically strong-arm China into granting the Pacific Empire many of the special privileges that European powers already enjoyed in the country. The demands were wide-ranging. Some were aggressive but nevertheless expected requests like extended control over Port Arthur, Manchuria, and Shandong, or guarantees of Japanese railroad and mining interests in the country. Other demands, however, were far more extreme. For example, sections 5 and 6 of the demands would have given Japan power over matters of taxation, government financing, state decision-making, and internal policing, all of which would arguably make China a Japanese protectorate. Enraged and dumbfounded, Chinese President Yuan Shikai rejected the initial demands. The Japanese returned to the negotiating table with a simplified list of only 13 demands, the more egregious requests having been omitted. Tacked onto the new demands was the ultimatum giving the Chinese only two days to respond. Yuan Shikai capitulated to Japanese demands and signed the various agreements into law on the 25th of May, 1915. In China, domestic resentment towards the deal with Japan and the Treaty of Versailles was explosive. The issue became known as the Shandong Question and served as a lightning rod for a new sense of Chinese nationalism. This sense of national outrage mixed with national identity was, in no small part, dependent upon a certain anti-Japanese sentiment. One could argue that this event, more than any other, is responsible for the birth of a new, far more aggressive variety of Chinese nationalism. Since the end of their war with Russia, Japan had exercised a hefty degree of control over Manchuria. However, this control came from their support of a man named Zhang Zhoulin, the region's powerful warlord. But in 1928, the overconfident Zhang angered his Japanese overlords and found himself on the wrong end of an assassin's pistol. His successor caused similar offense when he explicitly aligned himself with the Republic of China. So, in September of 1931, the Japanese army staged a fake Chinese attack on the South Manchurian Railway, which Japan controlled. The quote-unquote attack was nothing more than a pithy explosion which caused zero damage. Nevertheless, it served as sufficient pretext for invasion. The Japanese army easily took control of the city of Mukden before mounting a full-scale invasion of Manchuria only three days later. The Republic of China ordered its troops to withdraw from the region, leaving Manchuria firmly under Japanese control. In the end, China lost some 500 soldiers, the Japanese only lost two. The empire installed a superficial puppet government headed by the previously abdicated Chinese emperor Pu Yi and named this new country Manchukuo. Using the landmass as a base of operations, the Japanese proceeded to interfere in the region known as Inner Mongolia. Here, starting in 1935, well-organized imperial army soldiers pushed out Chinese forces with only light resistance, allowing the Japanese a significant measure of unofficial control over the region. In 1937, six years after the Mukden incident, Japanese forces clashed with Chinese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge, frighteningly close to Beijing. This marked a turning point. The conflict in the far north of China had spread to the most populous regions of the country. Since Mukden, an even greater wave of nationalism had spread through Chinese society. Despite their nearly irreconcilable differences, the factions and the warlords were suddenly united in their mission to oppose Japan with all they had. But this newly found unity of purpose did not instantly translate into defensive capacity. For the first two years of this new war, the Japanese army found remarkable success. The empire's forces seized major cities and provincial capitals going as far west as Hong Kao. They seized control of the majority of ports and dominated the rail network throughout most of the country. After a three-month-long siege, Chinese forces lost Shanghai in November of 1937 and were forced to flee the area. But the greatest loss in this Second Sino-Japanese War was yet to come. 
In December, after chasing the fleeing Chinese soldiers for more than 200 miles, Japanese troops seized control of the nationalist capital, Nanjing. Outraged and humiliated by the lengthy siege of Shanghai, the Japanese forces were, once again, hungry for revenge. What followed over the course of the next six weeks is known as the Nanjing Massacre, or more commonly, of Nanjing. Prince Yasuhiko Asaka, the emperor's uncle and leader of the Japanese forces, ordered his troops to kill all the captives that Japan had taken prisoner. The criminal directive was followed and 90,000 unarmed prisoners of war were put to death. Not satisfied with the scale of their first atrocity, the Japanese soldiers went on to murder every military-aged male they could find in Nanjing. In the end, at least 260,000 civilians were murdered, well over half the population of Nanjing. But this number does not include the 90,000 soldiers who were killed after surrender, which would raise the count to 350,000. The crimes against humanity did not stop at murder. At least 20,000 and as many as 80,000 women were raped by gangs of Japanese soldiers. The victims were assaulted by 10 or 20 men at a time, only to be murdered in the aftermath. Troops raided businesses and private homes under the guise of collecting food, destroying shop fronts and breaking down doors to loot and pillage. A Nazi trade representative named John Rabe was living in the city at the time. Despite his party affiliation, Rabe was disgusted by what he saw taking place. Under his leadership, a small coalition of about 24 foreigners who had not fled the city established the 2.5 square mile Nanjing safety zone. There, some 250,000 civilians hid, though they were subject to frequent raids by the Japanese military. After Nanjing's virtual destruction, the westward city of Hankou became the new capital. But the city's new status could not protect it from falling into Japanese hands in October of 1938, along with the city of Canton. Imperial forces then swept across the lower Yangtze Valley, taking control of all rail lines therein. And Japan's naval forces continued to dominate the sea. But Japan's good fortune soon ran thin. Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the Chinese nationalist forces, soon moved his capital to a more defensible position west of the Yangtze Gorges. Many of the nation's most prominent leaders regrouped with Chiang across the western provinces of Sichuan and Yunnan. There, they dug in for the long haul, still in control of about half of Chinese territory. Their defensive positions proved favorable, and they managed to frustrate the Japanese advance. Meanwhile, throughout occupied territory, Japan struggled to attain the cooperation of the resentful Chinese citizenry. Few Chinese civilians were willing to work with their new imperial overlords. Many thought collaboration to be shameful. Many others feared retribution from the underground militant operatives who served the loyalist cause. And while Japanese forces maintained control over cities and railways, they found significant opposition across the more rural swaths of their territory. There, guerrilla mobs loyal to an independent China were able to maintain informal control for years at a time. Though most guerrillas were originally servants of the nationalist cause, those affiliated with the communist faction often proved more effective thanks to their prior experience fighting Chiang's forces. Skilled in their covert operations, the Reds began sending their troops behind enemy lines. There they made common cause with rural villagers who, regardless of their previous party affiliation, were now willing to work with any group opposing the Japanese. In many cases, these communist operatives managed to transform small agricultural communities into well-organized self-defense units with secret local governments run by party members. Of course, these operatives also actively spread communist propaganda. And perhaps because of their intimate grassroots approach, the Communist Party began to expand exponentially. The Reds' largest fighting force was called the Eighth Route Army. This particular portion of the guerrilla insurgency saw its rosters balloon with shocking speed going from 30,000 troops in 1937 to 156,000 in 1938. 8th Route was ostensibly folded into the larger Nationalist Army in 1938, but in reality remained under communist control, operating independently in the mountains and plains of northern China. Meanwhile, the lesser communist force, known as the New Fourth Army, was charged with taking action in the lower Yangtze Valley, 
This trend of communist expansion would continue on throughout the war. Back in 1936, in the district of Pingfan in east-central Manchuria, a special detachment of the Japanese Imperial Army was established. Its name was Unit 731. The unit's innocuous title served to cover its insidious mission. The detachment and its 3,607 workers were tasked with a special kind of scientific investigation, the likes of which displayed such depravity that their labors are now synonymous with the acts of Dr. Joseph Mengele. Unit 731 researched and developed both chemical and biological weapons. Under the leadership of Japanese Surgeon General Shiro Ishii, the facility's personnel carried out some of the most egregious acts of torture and human experimentation ever seen in history. Chinese conscript laborers were brought on to construct Ping Fan. Many of these workers froze to death during the winter chills. Others were dealt with in mass executions after their work was done. The secrets of the facility would be protected at all costs. In their Manchurian base of operations, the Japanese scientists referred to their human subjects as logs, in keeping with the facility's official cover as a lumber mill. Just as in Hitler's death camps, the victims were given a number to replace their name. Likewise, the research campus at Ping Fan was equipped with three massive crematoriums in which the vast, uncounted dead were disposed of, their ashes leaving behind no remains for future generations to find. Despite official rules about who was to be experimented upon, in actual practice, there were no limits. Criminals and communist prisoners of war sat beside pregnant mothers and infant children in Ping Fan's cells. These people were delivered in trucks and railroad freight cars, often hidden beneath actual logs being brought to the camp. After arrival, the true work of Ping Fan would begin. Prisoners were infected with a wide range of communicable diseases, including typhoid, typhus, tularemia, anthrax, syphilis, cholera, tuberculosis, botulism, and any other viral or bacterial infections the physicians at Ping Fan wanted to study. Unit 731 workers had a special affinity for the bubonic plague, often throwing prisoners into pits filled with rats and fleas contaminated with the disease. For those imprisoned at Ping Fan, death was the most pleasant outcome. The victim's suffering did not end so long as their heart remained beating in their chest. Those who survived one round of experimentation were infected again and again to test the efficacy of certain inoculations. Some had blood repeatedly drawn from their bodies to test how long they could survive with ever fewer ounces of the vital fluid. Some were used to study the effects of frostbite on the human body. They were taken out into the woods in mid-December and forced to stand in ice water until their limbs were frozen. The more resilient test subjects suffered through every malady known to man. Necrotic rot, lymphatic inflammation, crippling fever, ulcers, buboes and boils, but above all, pain, debilitation, blinding, undiluted physical pain for months on end. The finale of each patient's time in the facility brought greater suffering still, as many of them were vivisected, a practice in which people are dissected while still alive. These victims were rarely given anesthetic to ease their suffering, because the scientists wanted to avoid tainting test results. Vital organs were regularly removed from the inmates whenever researchers required, say, a liver or an eye to examine. These people were often sewn back up and left to die without any form of treatment. Running out of research subjects was, after all, never a concern. The cities and villages throughout Japanese-occupied territory provided plenty of unfortunates, desperate enough to be lured into Ping Fan with a promise of food or extra employment. What's more, Unit 731 did not work alone. While Ping Fan was the largest research facility, it was only one of several dozen such institutions throughout Japanese-controlled lands. Japanese Surgeon General Shiro Ishii turned his methods of human experimentation into a vast network, which featured somewhat prominently in Japanese medical circles. And yet, despite acquiring a veneer of prestige, Ishii's networks of military researchers consistently violated the most fundamental ethical principles of medical practice. 
Each center was charged with investigating the effects of biochemical weapons on living people. Each did so without regard for basic human rights and dignity. Each saw untold thousands tortured until death. In October of 1940, a single airplane flew over Kaimingji. What at first was feared to be another bomber turned out to be something far stranger. From the air, the pilot dropped grain in vast quantities on the hungry population below. What followed was a scene more reminiscent of medieval Europe than 20th century China. Bubonic plague spread from the deposited fleas and food to the bodies of Kaimingji's civilian population. Within days, hundreds of cases sprung up. The outbreak went on for two full months before Chinese authorities could take any real action to stop the spread. Officials eventually evacuated the infected area and built a 14-foot wall around the quarantine zone. The Chinese covered the place in sulfur and burned the entire section of the city to eradicate the disease. This one event was only the first in a long line of experimental biological warfare attacks overseen by Shiro Ishii. At least 11 separate Chinese cities were attacked, often with ceramic explosives designed to detonate with minimal firepower so as to not damage the diseased-infested cargo they carried. Twelve separate attacks, all targeting civilians, were deployed. Some aimed to infect people by handing out bread and sweets contaminated with paratyphoid. Others tried to devastate crops with pernicious pests. And on several occasions, the Japanese troops were sent to poison life-giving sources of water. In 1941, bubonic plague was introduced to the city of Chengdi, a major population center. Once again, a single aircraft was deployed over the city, dropping food and other infected biomatter. In this attack, many thousands of people became infected at an alarming rate, hamstringing the nationalist government's response and causing widespread chaos. By early 1939, things had reached a freezing point. The nationalists held down the fort in the west, the guerrillas kept the Japanese army occupied, and Japan attempted to strangle Chinese supply lines. The Imperial Navy proved itself largely capable of blocking Chinese attempts to resupply on the vast eastern coast. While a few ports were only under intermittent Japanese occupation, the empire still managed to dominate this part of the country with only some difficulty. But the situation shifted in September of 1939 when Japan's ally, Germany, invaded Poland, kicking off World War II. Though deadlocked in China, the Empire of Japan encountered a golden opportunity on June 14, 1939, when Nazi troops marched into Paris and seized control of France. The fall of the French metropole left their colony, Indochina, modern-day Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, up for grabs. In 1940, they went south to occupy the former French territory and seize control of the last coastal rail line leading into southern China. But much to Japan's chagrin, alliances shifted and, eventually, the British began using their colony in Myanmar to sustain the Chinese. Japan then countered Britain's move in 1942 when they took control of Myanmar and the British colony of Hong Kong, once again cutting off supply lines into free China. Chung and the allied Chinese forces were left in dire straits. Back in 1941, the cooperation between the communists and the nationalists had begun to break down. The Reds' numbers had continued to grow despite taking serious losses. In 1940, the Eighth Route Army's ranks swelled to 400,000. Unwilling to obey Chiang Kai-shek's orders to evacuate their troops from certain regions, communist forces had found themselves, once again, in violent conflict with the nationalists. These conflicts ended any real collaboration between the two major parties in China's quote-unquote united front. The slow and rickety path to nationalist China's eventual encirclement left the country weak and desperate. Having lost all their major manufacturing hubs in the east, they were often unable to maintain the modernized standards they had come to embrace after the revolution. Without advanced manufacturing and access to transportation infrastructure, the nationalist government was unable to support its troops, much less the mass of civilian refugees that had fled into their territory from the occupied east. To make matters worse, Chiang's government instituted poor fiscal policies to cover short-term necessities, sparking rapid inflation. In 
These compounding problems left both the military and civilian populations destitute. Poverty and financial collapse led to widespread corruption within the army, where hoarding and graft became rampant. Malnutrition set in. And the lack of any nationalist offensive against the Japanese caused the Chinese armed forces to swiftly deteriorate. Quickly, the brief spike in support for Chiang's government that they experienced at the start of the war was winnowed away to nothing. And yet, despite their profound suffering, the people of free China refused to surrender to imperial forces. As the main opposition to Japan struggled in the West, the communists in the North and the East saw their fortunes improving. The local governments they created frequently encouraged mass participation in party activities. And having instituted land reforms, they pulled a great many peasant farmers over to their side with an improved standard of living. Japan's attempts at erecting a civilian puppet regime continued to flounder in the territories it controlled. Their troubles with recruitment remained a constant concern, and the few Chinese civilians willing to work with Japan were rarely seen as reliable leaders and bureaucrats. In early 1944, relief finally came in the form of material shipments from the United States. Nationalist soldiers trained to become pilots and mechanics, receiving support from the Allies. American and Chinese joint air operations dropped bombs on previously impenetrable Japanese holdfasts. Even so, Chiang's troops were far from ready to mount a grand campaign against occupying forces. After seven years of war and poor governance, the nationalists were left ineffective and unpopular. At the same time, the communist forces had only grown. As America fought the war in the Pacific and drew Japanese troops away from China, the Reds were all too happy to move into the vacuum they left behind. In the summer of 1945, Japan found itself in a familiar position, staring down the barrel of an American cannon. Once again, almost exactly 100 years after Commodore Perry opened up Japan, American warships were flocking to Japanese shores. At the end of July 1945, the Imperial Japanese Navy was no longer able to conduct major defensive operations. Allied forces were set to invade Japan's home islands. In public, the Japanese government expressed its determination to keep fighting. Privately, they were reaching out to the Soviet Union in hopes that Stalin and Molotov would act as mediators between them and the US. What happened next made all of this posturing seem infantile in comparison. Between August 5th and August 10th, 1945, three things happened. First, the United States dropped the first A-bomb on Hiroshima. The city was a supply and logistics hub for Japanese armed forces, and most importantly, housed the headquarters for the Second General Army, which had been tasked with commanding the defense of all southern Japan. The bomb's detonation marked the first use of nuclear weapons in the theater of war. The massive blast and subsequent fallout killed between 90,000 and 146,000 people, most of whom were civilians. Second, on August 9th, the Soviet Union mounted a full-scale invasion of Manchuria, which would only last 11 days. In that time, the Soviets confounded Japanese expectations with a series of surprise maneuvers. Despite only having 11 days, the Soviets managed to march through all of Manchuria, eventually stopping at the 38th parallel, wiping out Japanese control of the region. Third, also on August 9th, U.S. troops dropped a second nuke on Japan, this time targeting Nagasaki, killing between 60 and 80,000. Having taken one more blow than they could handle, the Japanese high command made a decision. For the very first time on August 15, 1945, Japan and its 77 million citizens heard their emperor's voice on the radio. To our good and loyal subjects, after pondering deeply the general trends of the world and the actual conditions obtaining in our empire today, we have decided to effect a settlement of the present situation by resorting to an extraordinary measure. We have ordered our government to communicate to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union that our empire accepts the provisions of their joint declaration. Though he did not use the word surrender, the intention was clear. By accepting the Potsdam Declaration, he was offering unconditional acquiescence to every single Allied demand. The war was over. Manchuria was now under active Soviet occupation, along with most of Mongolia. Puppet leaders previously employed by Japan were either captured by Soviet troops or fled to distant lands. Immediately, China's two remaining factions began a mad dash for the territory the Japanese had abandoned. 
Interestingly, at this point in the war, Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist troops were receiving support from both the US and the Soviet Union. Chiang's support from Stalin was conditioned on the USSR's retention of control over Port Arthur. But this was not necessarily his to guarantee. Mao's troops dominated the North and had control over the northeastern lands bordering the Soviet-occupied zone. The United States temporarily landed 50,000 troops in Beijing to hold down the fort, as 100,000 nationalist troops were flown in. The nationalists, apparently unconcerned for their reputation, began forcibly conscripting the local citizenry, looting local homes, and governing just as poorly in the eastern city as they had in the west for so many years. Needless to say, communist power only grew as a result as the rural peasants flocked to Mao. The nationalists, using U.S. military transport facilities, were quick to sweep up strategically valuable cities and grab rail lines as the Japanese evacuated. But they suffered from the same problem the Japanese experienced. Communist guerrillas occupied vast tracts of rural land and were essentially free to torment Chiang Kai-shek's troops exactly as they had the Japanese. Back in 1945, the Soviets had agreed to end their occupation of Manchuria in exchange for Chinese recognition of the Soviet-aligned Mongolian People's Republic. Suddenly, fearing the total extinction of the Chinese Communist Party, the USSR began to tip away from the nationalists. In 1946, as they were leaving, the Soviets handed the enormous stockpiles of Japanese weapons in Manchuria over to Mao's forces triggering further conflict between the two Chinese parties in the North. The USSR then began providing the communists with in-depth intelligence on nationalist troop movements, giving Mao a significant edge in the fight. The nationalists were caught up in further missteps as they began to work with Japanese generals. These former enemy commanders were responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Chinese citizens, who they killed through the use of scorched earth tactics in the North. Despite the negative impact on their reputation, the nationalists protected these war criminals who began to work closely with Chiang as his advisors. Their refusal to turn over Japanese war criminals for prosecution, and their even closer association with the former blue shirt Chinese fascists, resulted in a loss of support from the United States. The next nationalist offensive campaign against the communists saw them seize a major city at the untenable cost of one million troops. Despite urban losses, Mao now had an army of 5 million soldiers and could expand across rural reaches without high losses. By 1948, the communists began to capture major cities from Chiang's troops. Their losses meant little as they were able to immediately recruit more troops from the peasant population, a feat that nationalists could not achieve with their poor reputation. The communist advance south was sure-footed from there and nationalist leaders began either fleeing to Taiwan or defecting to the communist cause. On October 1st, 1949, from the new capital of Beijing, Mao proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China. The Allied occupation of Japan was plotted out in a series of conferences before Japanese surrender. The Allies, China, Britain, the USSR, and the United States, put particular attention into how Japan would be disarmed how to prevent future remilitarization, how its colonies would be managed, and how its economy would be stabilized. And while the other allied nations had a say in what reforms were implemented, the nation was, first and foremost, occupied by troops of the United States. In September of 1945, U.S. General MacArthur was appointed Supreme Allied Commander of Japan, placing him in charge of what would become a seven-year-long occupation. Having received his command, MacArthur plotted out his strategy for reforming the Japanese society. First, destroy the military power, punish war criminals, build the structure of representative government, modernize the constitution, hold free elections, enfranchise the women, release the political prisoners, liberate the farmers, establish a free labor movement, encourage free economy, abolish police oppression, develop a free and responsible press, liberalize education, decentralize the political power, separate church from state. Japan's refusal to surrender into the last possible moment meant the destruction of an exceptional amount of the nation's infrastructure. Firebombing campaigns and supply shortages left the people of Japan physically and mentally exhausted. US B-29 bombers targeted manufacturing and transportation hubs, 
major and minor cities were crippled under the weight of American military might. Tokyo had been all but destroyed after American air raids carpeted the city, killing more than 83,000 and leaving over 1 million homeless. By the end of the war, more than 600 major industrial facilities had been destroyed. As many as 500,000 Japanese citizens had been killed, and 8.5 million had no place to sleep at night. When the occupation began, 4.2 million new homes needed to be built. Transportation networks had to be restored. Schools and hospitals had to be constructed, and, most importantly, food production had to be re-established. In the final years of the war, the average Japanese adult was living on just 1,042 calories per day. Though in major urban areas like Tokyo, things were even worse, with people living on a little over 700 calories each day. Immediately, emergency wheat donations were shipped in from the U.S. The government higher-ups who had been involved with military affairs were largely purged from political office. 28 of these dismissed politicians found themselves in handcuffs, standing trial for war crimes in Tokyo. In total, only seven officials were put to death, with 16 receiving life sentences. Emperor Hirohito, and indeed all members of the extended royal family, were spared prosecution, despite having committed a panoply of crimes during the war. Among those who went unpunished was the emperor's uncle, Prince Yasuhiko Asaka, who, as previously discussed, was responsible for the Nanjing Massacre. In his place, Iwane Matsui was, controversially, held responsible despite having taken some actions that arguably would exonerate him. Shiro Ishii and his cronies escaped from justice by striking a deal with General MacArthur. To dodge prosecution, the scientists released all their illegal research findings to the U.S., which in turn covered up the truth of the horrors they committed. The reinstitution of a liberal democratic state began with a reduction in the role of the emperor. The monarchy became a figurehead. Its powers largely transferred to the hands of the democratically elected leadership. Wealthy landlords who had previously owned the majority of agricultural properties in the country were made to sell vast quantities of land. In turn, this land was sold at cost to their previous tenant farmers, breaking apart the nation's heavily concentrated agricultural industry. The wealthy elites of Japan saw their bases of power partially destroyed as worker unions, antitrust legislation, and labor rights were all put in place. Elections were held with shocking speed, the first taking place on the 10th of April 1946. This election was the first in which Japanese women had the right to vote. One year after, Japan's new pacifist constitution was adopted. The document's ratification stripped away the nation's right to wage war and build up its military forces. The constitution did allow for the creation of smaller Japanese self-defense forces, which would operate in conjunction with American troops to protect Japan from the rising communist threats to the west and north. Unsurprisingly, with one nation facing substantial international isolation and the other completely demilitarized, Sino-Japanese relations became notably less scintillating. Even so, in 1950, the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance, and Mutual Assistance was signed. Article 1 of the treaty was a mutual defense pact designed to prevent the revival of Japanese imperialism. In 1952, Japan recognized the government in Taiwan, aka the Republic of China, as the legitimate Chinese state. Despite this, the Japanese government exchanged trade, labor, and cultural delegations with Communist China in the 1950s to maintain diplomatic relations. In 1952, Mao's China and the Japanese government ratified their first trade deal. In 1958, Mao's government severed all trade ties with Japan out of frustration over Japan's support of the Republic of China. But these bonds were soon mended in 1960 out of desperation after the Soviet Union broke its previously close ties with Communist China, forcing the nation to backtrack to defend its economy. In 1972, relations between Japan and Communist China were normalized with the signing of a joint communique. The document outlined three key points. First, Japan acknowledged its hand in causing great harm to the Chinese people during its invasion and occupation. In turn, China renounced its demands for war reparations. Second, Japan, at least on paper, recognized the Communist People's Republic of China as the only government of China, and agreed that Taiwan was an inalienable part of the territory of the People's Republic. And lastly, the agreement confirmed that the two countries would establish diplomatic relations, exchange ambassadors, and would negotiate agreements in trade, 
shipping, aviation, and fisheries. A long-term private trade agreement was signed by China and Japan in February of 1978. Under this deal, trade was meant to increase by 20 billion US dollars within the next seven years, with Japan exporting production equipment, technology, construction materials, and machine parts in exchange for crude oil and coal. This ploy proved overly optimistic when, the following year, the Chinese were compelled to slow their development goals and scale down their financial obligations. Despite it being downgraded, the deal was a major milestone and demonstrated the two countries' dedication to normalization. From there, the story of relations between the two nations is one of investment and peaceful coexistence, with a few important caveats. Despite the comparatively muted relations the two countries had experienced over the past 70 years, the reality of China and Japan's sordid past shines through to today. In March of 2005, 17 Chinese cities erupted in protest. The angry citizens weren't reprimanding their leaders or demanding domestic change. Rather, their anger was turned outward. The mass demonstrations were directed against Japan. The angry mobs, several thousand strong, marched on Japanese consulates throughout the country, threw rocks through the Japanese embassy's windows in Beijing, and filled the streets with chants of boycott Japanese businesses. Why? Well, the reason wasn't exactly clear. Some protesters were expressing outrage over new Japanese history textbooks that grossly understated Japanese war crimes during the Second World War. Others were enraged at the recent G4 proposal, requesting Japan be given a seat on the UN Security Council. Many others were simply content to toss eggs at Japanese restaurants and grocery stores, expressing a generalized sense of rage that they felt towards the island nation. Outraged, the Japanese government demanded financial restitution for the damages suffered, condemned the violence that broke out, and not much else. The curious spat of unrest could have been ignored. But then, in August of 2012, it happened again, even larger than before. This time, the cause was a bit more obvious. The CCP had whipped up its citizenry into a blind rage over a territorial dispute concerning the small, uninhabited Japanese-owned Senkaku Islands, which China claims as their territory. The first bout of protests sprung up after two activists from Hong Kong who had sailed to the islands were detained by the Japanese Coast Guard. The demonstrators, reportedly calling for their government to cease trade with Japan and retake the islands by force, marched across the city of Shenzhen. As they walked, the angry mobs smashed Japanese cars, burned the Japanese flag, and vandalized any store selling products made in Japan. In the end, hordes of armed police were sent in to disperse the furious crowds, arresting several protesters in the process. Events with varying levels of intensity took place in nine other cities, but tensions briefly cooled. Until the 11th of September, when China sent two ships to the island to assert their claim of ownership. Japan promptly nationalized the Senkaku Islands, and four days later, a second barrage of protests began. These demonstrations, even larger than the ones earlier in the year, quickly ballooned beyond the bounds of state control. The cities of Changsha and Qingdao were the first to see instances of arson and mass vandalism. Once again, across the country, Japanese cars were smashed. A Toyota Motors outlet was set on fire, as were two Panasonic factories in Suzhou and Shandong. Two Japanese department stores in Qingdao and Changsha were plundered by rogue demonstrators. Thousands of malcontents busted their way into the Garden Hotel in Guangzhou, where the Japanese consulate was housed. In Shenyang, an angry mob threw bottles of ink at the Japanese consulate's pristine white walls. On September 18th, another group surrounded U.S. Ambassador Gary Locke's car, refusing to let him enter the Japanese embassy. When all was said and done, 180 cities saw mass events in which protesters vented their rage and called for a boycott of all Japanese-made goods. With Chinese power on the rise and Japan in a comparatively pacified state, one may inevitably be forced to ask hard questions. Questions like, can Japan be bullied into submission? And if the answer is yes, what does that mean for the sovereignty of free nations living in the shadow of authoritarian China? Will the governments of democratic states in East Asia be allowed to govern for their people? Or will they be put in the same position that China found itself in so many years ago? forced to bow to the whims of imperialist powers willing to abuse human rights to maintain their own power. Despite its centuries-long hiatus, China is, once again, the powerhouse of the East, and those wishing to maintain their power in the Chinese Communist Party 
have proven time and time again that they have no qualms about inflaming violent nationalism to distract their citizens from increasingly authoritarian rule at home. There are many alive today who can recall the horrors visited upon the Chinese people at the hands of the Japanese Empire. There are even more who grew up hearing stories of what happened from their parents, their grandparents, and their great-grandparents. Such a large population with such an intimately close connection to the crimes that were committed will not be willing to forgive and forget anytime soon. And though the old militaristic regime that once ruled an empire has been dead in the ground for 78 years, the people of China will never see the promise of the liberal democratic society that so aptly replaced it. For as long as an authoritarian government rules in China, her people will remain in darkness, never seeing the light of truth that a free nation can provide. This is the chart of the Japanese yen. It's in free fall. This represents a big problem for Japan's economy. This is what the yen was trading for 10 years ago. This is what the yen is trading at today, and this is what the yen is projected to trade at in the coming months. Shocked? <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. For the first time since 1998, this is what the government has now been forced to do just to moderate the situation. The currency market has been a focus of attention this year, especially in Japan. Could the MOF step in and intervene on the currency? <laughs> to stem the yen's decline. So much worry about Japan's currency that the government intervened. This was a very large intervention operation. The intention there was to send a fairly strong signal to the market. In yet another episode of 2022 wreaking havoc in the financial markets, what was once a world-acknowledged safe haven currency has now been turned into another desolate currency. Yes, I'm talking about the Japanese yen and how it is crashing to the ground. In what has been a constant decline this year, the Japanese yen is falling to levels last seen decades ago against the US dollar. While you may sit there and think that this is a problem whose consequences are exclusive to Japan, yeah, you're sadly mistaken. As the yen falls and creates economic turbulence within the nation, the whole world, and particularly the United States, will be affected, in a way. In this video, I will explain just how the falling yen is creating an economic crisis in Japan, and I will also explain how this is going to have international ramifications. The depreciating Japanese currency yen has become a cause of concern. Decades of stable or falling prices. So when inflation finally hit, it came as a huge shock. For manufacturers and local retail payers. Historically, that is within the intervention ban. That's what has happened before, yes? What is happening with Japan's economy is something that the international community has its sights on, mainly just because it's something that was not expected to happen. For the longest time, the yen has been seen as a safe haven, which investors traditionally bought at times of crisis. Now things don't appear so haven-y, and as Japan loses that status, so too does the yen as it falls into deeper depths. Honestly, given that this year alone has seen the Japanese yen lose over 20% of its value against the US dollar, propelling it to hit the lowest level since 1990, it makes sense why this matter is one of absolute urgency. The immediate question that I'm sure is on your mind is, why? Why is this happening? Well, I made a video explaining that exact scenario a few months ago. If you haven't watched it, feel free to click this link right here to watch it. Regardless, I'll explain it in brief again. What is the major driving factor in the collapse of the yen? Well, okay, let's call it a decline. Collapse might be a bit too harsh. What is driving the decline of the yen is largely the difference between interest rates in Japan and the USA. Yes, policies in the United States can have quite a bearing on other economies. If you didn't know that, well, now you know. That is the influence that comes with having the world's reserve currency as your own. In the interest of its own people, and in a bid to tackle inflation, the United States Federal Reserve has been aggressively hiking its main interest rates this year. Since March of this year, the rate has risen from 0.25% to 4%. This table here shows how the Fed has hiked it with each consecutive month that has come. This comes in contrast to Japan's own interest rate, which at present sits at negative 0.1%. Yeah, you heard that right. I said Japan's interest rate is negative 
The problem that comes with Japan having such a low interest rate, while the US has a significantly larger interest rate, is that the higher interest rates tend to make a currency more attractive to investors. As a result, there's less demand for currencies from countries like Japan that have lower rates, and those currencies then fall in value. When you factor in the fact that the dollar is rising in value as the yen has been falling, it explains why the disparity between the two countries is so significant. Where all this takes a level up from just a slumping currency to, as the video is titled, an economic crisis, is when you factor in this. As good as the Japanese economy seems on the surface, its economy has barely grown at all for the last 30 years. This chart shows just how the economy has been performing for the past three decades. As you can see, it's only grown by a factor of about 1.62% in three decades. Truthfully, for the most part, the economy has been stagnant. This has led to some experts believing that the weak yen reflects the state of the country's finances, a point that might hold some water. Japan's economic woes do not end there. For those of you who don't already know this, this point might surprise you. Japan just so happens to be the world's most indebted country. The island nation has the highest national debt in the world at 235% of its GDP. A stagnant economy plus a rising debt are not two things that any country wants to deal with at one time. And yet, that is Japan's current predicament. To add to this, Japan is also facing the Asian demographic time bomb of a low birth rate and a population with the highest proportion of older people in the world. That raises doubt about its ability to maintain economic structures when the working population fails to meet the demands. This is a social issue, but it's prudent that I mention it here, because it has very serious economic ramifications for the nation's economy. When you take all the factors that we've been talking about into effect, you will see that the Japanese economy is in clutch time. Even experts like Takashi Fujimaki, a former advisor to billionaire investor George Soros, have been on the record saying, there is no reason for the yen to strengthen. He has been vocal about the yen's shortcomings, often writing articles like this one. He previously stated that he expects the Japanese currency to hit 180 against the US dollar before eventually just collapsing in value. And well, things certainly seem to be headed that way. Hey, quick reminder, please hit that subscribe button. It just takes a second and I'm trying to hit a million subscribers. So if you're not subscribed, please hit that button. In Japan, the yen tumbled to a 24 year low against the dollar this week. 130 by year end. Experts are warning of a potential foreign exchange market crisis. Asia's number two economy is having a horrible year. A level not seen since 1998. I can already see you banging on your table and just screaming, just raise the interest rate to be competitive. I mean, in truth, I thought of that too. But it seems like it's not so simple. The Bank of Japan's governor, Haruhiko Kuroda, has explicitly stated on multiple occasions that the Japanese economy is too weak to handle higher interest rates. Well, that makes for quite the conundrum. How do you raise rates to better the currency that is then supposed to boost the economy when the current economy is too weak for an interest hike in the first place? Ugh, what a headache. It's expected that, until Kuroda's retirement in 2024, the Japanese interest rate will stay around the ballpark of where it currently is. This means that for the foreseeable future, what you are currently witnessing is what you will get, if not worse, when it comes to Japan. Makes for quite an interesting story. However, it's not all bad news for Mr. Kuroda and the Japanese policymakers. Due to the economic crisis and the problems it carries with it, inflation has started to creep into the nation. In any other country, and I'm looking at you, United States, rising inflation levels are a problem. In Japan, however, inflation is good news because traditionally Japan has faced deflation and falling prices. This was bad for them because it did not encourage heavy consumer spending as citizens hold back on splurging on the assumption that prices will fall further in the future. This doesn't keep money in heavy circulation and that hurts the economy. That is why Mr. Kuroda has said that the bank's current policy is necessary to help it reach its 2% inflation target. But all right, that's enough of what the government can't do. Let's talk about what it actually has done 
and this one is a big move. The Japanese government has been content to remain on the sidelines, but as the yen continued to slump heavily downwards, the government saw it prudent to jump in. In September, the authority stepped in, spending $21 billion to buy the yen in a bid to slow the currency slump. This took place as the yen had fallen to its lowest levels ever. The finance ministry vice minister, Kanda Masoto, revealed that the government had intervened for the first time since 1998 because it was necessary. In his remark, he said, the government has just taken decisive action. However, this strategy only helped for a very short time. As soon after, the currency began tumbling again, getting worse than before. You see, the government's intervention was aimed at strengthening its currency. This works like so. Yen buying reduces the amount of yen in the market and raises its value. However, the Bank of Japan's ultra-easy policy had the opposite effect. As monetary loosening increased the sum of money in the market, thereby lowering the value of the yen. The government buying the yen, while the Bank of Japan maintains its easy stance, is like stepping on the gas and the brakes at the same time. This might be what caused the negation of the government's efforts. Economist Kumano Hideo says officials are painfully aware that the intervention can only accomplish so much. He said, the government knows that the effects of intervention are limited. That's why it launched a surprise attack, so to speak, at the most effective time, just after all the major monetary policy decisions. You deploy such a strategy when you know your battle strength is lacking, so to speak. However, even as the government continues to intervene on and off the record, it can only do so for so long. The Japanese government has a foreign exchange fund special account that has about $1.3 trillion in it. On paper, this makes it likely that the government can just keep intervening. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Much of that money has been invested into things like U.S. government bonds. So the amount of liquidity the government has may actually not be that much. It is very likely that the government has no intention of continuing intervention for an extended period, simply because it can't. Several experts have also warned that these attempts to prop up the yen will only ever have a short-term effect. And if the government's last attempts are to be taken as proof of this, then, well, it's conclusive evidence. We all know that these policies and crises come down and affect the everyday person. So what does this mean for you? Well, for starters, the weak yen makes everything Japan buys more expensive. Since the island nation relies heavily on imported oil and gas, this means that they will spend significantly more money on imports. The prices of imports have been rising all year as the yen has been falling in value. Economist Kumano Hideo noted, the yen started drastically weakening from March. If the currency exchange rate goes from 115 yen against the dollar to, say, 145 yen, that pushes up import prices by about 30%. As import prices rise, so too does the cost of imported goods. At present, people across Japan are feeling these effects, with shoppers complaining about price hikes. This is made worse when you factor in the fact that Japan's consumers have seen their purchasing power halved over the last decade. For example, just 10 years ago, 10,000 yen would buy an item worth $132. But today, it only gets you something worth $67. For the average citizen, this is not good at all, because average salaries in Japan have hardly risen over three decades. It all comes back to what I said earlier about the stagnation of the economy. If you are Japanese and are traveling abroad, or need to pay for things abroad, or have kids in school abroad, then, oh yikes, you must not like the current situation at all. The only shred of positivity is if you are making money abroad. Then you're set, as the money will be worth much more at home. As exports account for about 15% of the country's total economic activity, that is not an insignificant figure. So, where does all this talking leave us? Well, we have a country that has a currency that is falling in value faster than thought possible. As a result, this drop in value is dragging with it its already stagnant economy, bringing the nation to the fringes of an economic crisis. The citizens aren't happy, as they are losing purchasing power daily, and try as they might, the government interventions aren't doing anything to help. 
Japan's only Trump card will come after the Bank of Japan's current governor retires and then maybe they will appoint someone who will raise interest rates. Alternatively, they can just hang on until the US stops hiking its own interest rates. Either way, for a superpower like Japan, none of this looks good. And none of these options can be regarded as a solid strategy. For all intents and purposes, Japan is in Hail Mary territory now. And thank you so much to our Patreon for making this video possible. Please check out the Patreon by clicking the link in the description and consider supporting these videos. A few days ago, China released its 2023 edition of what's known as the Standard Map. But this isn't your average map. It's creating quite a stir on the international stage. This new map showed Indian territories as part of China's sovereign territory, specifically Akshay Chin and Arunachal Pradesh. Beijing claimed these areas as their own, and India responded with a strong rebuttal. But this isn't just about China and India. The controversy has snowballed, with most stakeholders getting involved. China's neighbors, including the Philippines, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Vietnam, have all lodged strong protests against this map. So why are they so angry? To kick things off, let's take a closer look at this controversial map that China just published. The map features something called the Nine Dash Line, a concept that has no legal basis. This line is essentially China's way of laying claim to vast stretches of territory, including parts of Russia, India, and even Taiwan. As you can see, this line stretches across the South China Sea, encompassing an enormous area. But here's the twist. China has now added an extra dash to the east of Taiwan, implying that Taiwan is part of China's territory. This move has set off alarm bells worldwide, and rightfully so. India's external affairs minister, Dr. S. Haishankar, called China's claims absurd and said, this is an old habit of theirs. It is not something which is new. Making absurd claims does not make other people's territories yours. While the Philippines stated that the map has no basis under international law, Malaysia too dismissed China's claims, maintaining its stance of rejecting any foreign party's sovereignty claims over its maritime features. The international community is not mincing words when it comes to criticizing China's actions. This map is undeniably causing a diplomatic storm. Now let's hear what China has to say in its defense. China argues that this map is a routine practice, something they do regularly, and it's in line with their exercise of sovereignty. They want everyone to view the matter objectively and calmly, and avoid overinterpretation. The timing of this map's release is interesting, given that the G20 summit is just around the corner. Is China trying to set the stage for discussions at the summit, or is there a more straightforward explanation? To better grasp what's happening now, let's look at the history between India and China. First, be sure to hit the like button. A video pointing out CCP's mistake is most definitely going to get downvoted by CCP bots, so your likes help us a lot with the algorithm. In the late 19th century, the world was undergoing profound changes, and the balance of power was shifting. This is when the Anglo-Chinese Convention of 1890 came into play. It was a very important event in the history of how China and Britain interacted. This convention was signed on September 20th, 1890 in Beijing, and had a big impact on both countries and how much control they had in East Asia. Before this, in the mid-19th century, China had lost in the Opium Wars, which were really embarrassing. This led to a bunch of unfair deals with Western countries, especially the Treaty of Nanking in 1842. These deals gave foreign people special rights in China and gave away parts of China to Western countries. Around the same time, as countries were trying to grab land in Africa, they were also trying to do the same thing in East Asia. Britain wanted to make sure it didn't lose its power in China and tried to stop other countries from taking over. One of the central provisions of the convention was the establishment of a demarcation line. This line extended from the mouth of the Irrawaddy River in Burma, now Myanmar, to the mountains of Tibet, effectively dividing British-controlled Burma and Chinese-controlled Tibet. The convention reaffirmed China's sovereignty over Tibet while recognizing British influence and control in Burma. It marked a significant departure from previous agreements as it acknowledged China's authority in Tibet. Crucially, the convention included a promise of non-interference in Tibet by both Britain and China, seeking to maintain the status quo and preserve stability in the region. For Britain, the convention helped consolidate its control over Burma, securing its strategic interests in Southeast Asia. It also provided a framework for maintaining influence in Tibet. China, on the other hand, saw the convention as a diplomatic victory, as it reaffirmed its sovereignty over Tibet. This recognition bolstered China's prestige and authority on the international stage. However, the convention also contributed to Tibet's isolation from the rest of the world. The promise of non-interference meant that Tibet was left to its own devices, which had both positive and negative 
the consequences for the region. These provisions, while seemingly straightforward, would set the stage for future conflicts and debates. At the turn of the 20th century, the British Empire was at its highest point in India. Meanwhile, Russia was expanding its influence in Central Asia, sparking the great game for supremacy in the region. The British aimed to secure their northern frontier, aka Arunachal Pradesh, and maintain their control over the Indian subcontinent. Tibet, a remote and mysterious region, had traditionally maintained its independence under the spiritual and temporal authority of the Dalai Lama. It had little direct contact with the outside world, but that was about to change. In 1914, amidst World War II, a conference was convened in Simla, a picturesque hill station in British India. The participants included representatives from Britain, Tibet, and China. Sir Henry McMahon represented the British, while the dependents were led by Lachlan Satra and the Chinese by Ivan Chen. The primary focus of the conference was to define the boundary between British India and Tibet. A series of maps were drawn, outlining the proposed borders. The McMahon Line, named after the British representative, played a central role in these discussions. On July 3, 1914, the Simla Accord was signed by the British and Tibetan representatives, marking an agreement on the McMahon Line as the boundary between British India and Tibet. However, the Chinese representative refused to sign, and ambiguities in the accord would haunt the region for decades. The outbreak of World War I overshadowed the Simla Accord, diverting global attention. The British, preoccupied with the war, failed to enforce the accord, leading to its virtual abandonment. The McMahon Line, established during the Simla Accord, will become a source of dispute between India and China, leading to the Sino-Indian War of 1962. The legacy of this accord continues to influence geopolitics in the region. The validity of the McMahon Line is a matter of international law. Some legal experts argue that the line is valid because it was signed by the Tibetan government, which at the time, an independent state. Others argue that the line is invalid because China was not a party to the Simla Agreement and because the Tibetan government did not have the authority to cede territory to British India. In 1947, India gained independence from British colonial rule, and in 1949, the People's Republic of China was established under Chairman Mao Zedong. These two neighboring nations, both freshly independent and navigating their post-colonial past, were about to face a series of challenges along their shared border. The border between India and China was not clearly defined in many areas. The McMahon Line came back, haunting both nations. Along with the McMahon Line, another disputed area was Aksai Chin, a high-altitude desert region that both India and China claimed. The first major conflict erupted in 1947 in the eastern sector of the India-China border, particularly in the regions of Tawang and NEFA, Northeast Frontier Agency, now Arunachal Pradesh. The conflict began when an Indian patrol team encountered a Chinese patrol team in an area that both countries claimed as their own. The two teams exchanged words, and eventually, the Indian team demanded that the Chinese team turn back. The Chinese team refused, and the two teams faced off, each with their weapons drawn. In the midst of escalating tensions, both India and China engaged in negotiations to resolve their border disputes. Various meetings and discussions took place, but no concrete solution was reached during 1947 to 1948. In the wake of World War II, China was undergoing radical changes. The Chinese Civil War raged with the Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, emerging victorious in 1949. This marked the beginning of the People's Republic of China. In 1949, as the Chinese Civil War ended, a Tibetan delegation arrived in Beijing to discuss their nation's status, seeking recognition and peaceful coexistence with the new communist regime. The talks seemed promising, but behind the scenes, geopolitical ambitions were at play. China saw Tibet as a vital piece in its vision of a united communist China. In October 1950, the Chinese PLA, without a formal declaration of war, began massing troops at the Tibetan border, the Dalai Lama. Tibetan spiritual and temporal leader faced an agonizing decision. The Dalai Lama, after extensive deliberations, decided to sign the 17-point agreement, effectively recognizing Chinese sovereignty over Tibet. However, it is widely debated whether this agreement was signed under duress, with a threat of military force looming large. The Chinese invasion led to the occupation of Tibet. Chinese troops entered Lhasa, the capital, and Tibetan resistance was crushed. Tibetan culture, religion, and way of life faced radical transformations. The same year, India recognized Tibet as an autonomous region of China. This diplomatic move further complicated the India-China relationship. India was concerned about the Chinese invasion of Tibet for several reasons. 
First, Tibet has been a buffer state between India and China, and its occupation by China would give China a strategic advantage. Second, India had a long history of cultural and religious ties to Tibet, and the Chinese invasion was seen as a threat to those ties. Third, India feared that the Chinese invasion would set a precedent for China to invade other countries in the region. The Indian government's response to the Chinese invasion was complex and difficult. On the one hand, India wanted to avoid a military conflict with China, which would have been costly and dangerous. On the other hand, India wanted to protect its interests in Tibet and the region. Ultimately, the Indian government decided to take a cautious approach, hoping that China would eventually withdraw from Tibet. However, China did not withdraw from Tibet, and the border dispute between India and China remained unresolved. On November 20th, 1950, the Chinese government announced a ceasefire and put a temporary halt to hostilities in the ongoing China-India border conflict. Several factors prompted this ceasefire. First, the Chinese military was making rapid gains in the eastern sector of the conflict, and it was clear that India was in danger of losing large amount of territory. Second, the United States was considering providing military assistance to India, which would have put China in a difficult position. Third, the Chinese government was eager to improve its international image, and a ceasefire would help to do that. The ceasefire agreement called for both sides to withdraw their troops to positions 20 kilometers behind the line of actual control. The ceasefire agreement was not a permanent solution to the China-India border conflict. However, it did help to reduce tensions between the two countries and allow for further negotiations. Both countries have had several talks since the ceasefire, but no agreement has been reached on the border issue. In the spirit of cooperation, both India and China participated in the Asian Relations Conference in 1947 and the Bangdung Conference in 1955. However, the seeds of their collaboration were sown earlier. In 1954, Nehru's historic visit to China laid the foundation for the Panchil Agreement. At its core were the five principles of peaceful coexistence. The first principle emphasized the recognition of each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty. This laid the foundation for resolving border disputes through peaceful means. The second principle, mutual non-aggression, committed both countries to refrain from the use of force and military aggression in their dealings with each other. The third principle called for non-interference in each other's internal affairs, respecting the principles of self-determination and non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. The fourth principle emphasized equality and mutual benefit in all aspects of their relations, including trade, economic cooperation, and cultural exchanges. The fifth and final principle was the commitment to peaceful coexistence, emphasizing the importance of diplomacy, dialogue, and peaceful resolution of conflicts. On April 29, 1954 in Beijing, Prime Minister Nehru and Premier Zhao Enlai signed the Panchil Agreement, solidifying their commitment to these principles. The Panchil Agreement held immense significance. It marked the beginning of India-China cooperation and their commitment to resolving disputes through peaceful means. However, there are a number of reasons why the Panchil Agreement had not been effective in preventing border conflicts. One reason is that the agreement is vague and open to interpretation. For example, the principle of mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty is not clear about what constitutes a violation of sovereignty. This has led to disagreements between India and China about where the border lies. Another reason for the ineffectiveness of the Panchil Agreement is that the two countries have different political systems and strategic interests. India is a democracy, while China is a communist country. China has a strategic interest in maintaining a balance of power in Asia, while China has a strategic interest in expanding its influence. These different interests have made it difficult for the two countries to reach a mutually agreeable solution to the border dispute. Now let's fast forward to 1959, March 10th to be precise. This day marked a pivotal moment in Tibetan history. Tibetans rose up against Chinese rule, and the Dalai Lama, at great personal risk, fled the Tibetan capital, Lhasa. His escape was fraught with danger as he traversed the treacherous Himalayan mountains. The Dalai Lama's journey to India was a daring escape that captured the world's attention. He crossed the border into India on March 31, 1959, where he was welcomed with open arms by then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. Dalai Lama eventually sought asylum in the Indian town of Dara Shamala. Nations around the world expressed support for him and condemned China's actions in Tibet. The United Nations took up the matter, but little concrete action was taken. So how did this impact Sino-Indian relations? Well, it further strained an already fragile relationship. India, which had initially recognized Tibet as an autonomous region within China, was now providing refuge to the Dalai Lama, essentially recognizing him as the Tibetan leader in exile. The Dalai Lama's presence in India also had a lasting impact. 
Dar Shamala became the headquarters of the Tibetan government in exile, and the Tibetan diaspora continues to thrive there today. This event further cemented India's position as a refuge for Tibetans fleeing Chinese rule. China was furious about India's stance and viewed it as a betrayal. This event soured diplomatic ties, leading to a series of skirmishes along the disrupted Sino-Indian border in 1959 and eventually the Sino-Indian War in 1962. Both nations kept proposing diplomatic solutions between 1960 and 1962. However, none of these efforts bore fruit. In response, India implemented the forward policy, establishing advanced posts in disputed areas and seeking military aid from the West, which was initially denied by the US. Ironically, this led India to turn to the Soviets for military assistance, as the US thought they were too soft on communism. This shift in reliances would prove significant. Meanwhile, in China, Chairman Mao Zedong stated, Nero wants to move forward and we won't let him. The stage was set for a confrontation. The Chinese chose their moment wisely, launching attacks in both eastern and western border regions on October 20th, 1962. China had a much larger army than India, with over 800,000 soldiers compared to India's 400,000. China also had more advanced weapons, including tanks and artillery. With India ill-prepared and undermanned, Chinese forces made significant advances. The Indian Western Command withdrew many isolated outposts. In the east, the Chinese surprised the Indian forces by fording the Namkachu River, catching them off guard. The Indian troops withdrew into Bhutan. As the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded, the world's attention was diverted, allowing the Chinese to press their advantage. Thousands of Chinese troops attacked Indian positions, leading to further territorial gains. The Indian government was caught off guard by the attack and was unable to mount an effective defense. The war took a heavy toll on both sides, with thousands of casualties and prisoners of war. The harsh winter conditions in the Himalayas added to the challenges faced by both armies. Negotiations stalled repeatedly, and India declared a national emergency. The US and UK supported India, shipping military aid. Fighting resumed in November, but it became clear that the Chinese were prepared to withdraw to the original control lines. Finally, on November 19, 1962, a unilateral ceasefire was declared, marking the end of the Sino-Indian War. China captured a large swath of territory from India, including the entire Aksai Shin region. The war was a major humiliation for India. Diplomatic ties were severed, and mistrust lingered for years. India embarked on military modernization and nuclear development. The war also strained India's relationship with Pakistan. Two and a half decades later, in 1987, tensions flared again. This time, it was in the remote region of Sumdurong Chu in Arunachal Pradesh. The standoff was triggered by a Chinese construction project to build a helipad and other infrastructure in the Sumdurong Chu Valley, which India viewed as an incursion into its territory. This area is strategically important because it lies near the tri-junction of India, China, and Bhutan. The Indian government saw China's activities as an attempt to strengthen its position in the region. The skirmish was fierce, but non-lethal. Both sides used their fists and makeshift weapons, avoiding fatalities but sending a clear message. The situation escalated with both sides sending troops and increasing their military presence in the area. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi initiated diplomatic efforts to prevent further escalation. Diplomats from both countries met in Beijing to discuss a peaceful resolution, avoiding an all-out conflict. Eventually, after weeks of intense negotiations, both sides agreed to withdraw their troops from the valley, avoiding a full-scale war. During the early 1990s, India and China encountered a critical juncture in their bilateral ties, especially concerning their contested border regions. Over the years, intermittent disputes had ignited military clashes and prolonged standoffs. In a bid to avert further escalation and foster harmonious coexistence, both nations initiated a diplomatic endeavor that ultimately led to the ratification of the Agreement on Maintaining Peace and Serenity along the line of actual control in the India-China border regions in September 1993. The agreement consists of nine articles, which outline the following commitments by the two countries. To maintain the status quo along the line of actual control, LAC, pending a final settlement of the boundary question. To reduce their military forces along the LAC to minimum levels compatible with friendly and good neighborly relations. To refrain from conducting any military exercises involving more than one division in close proximity to the LAC. 
to notify each other of military exercises involving more than one brigade along the LAC, to establish a working mechanism for consultation and coordination on border affairs, to resolve any disputes arising out of the implementation of the agreement through peaceful means. The 1993 agreement was a significant step forward in the India-China relationship. The agreement also helped to reduce tensions between the two countries, which had been high in the wake of the 1962 Sino-Indian War. While the 1993 agreement marked a significant milestone in Sino-Indian relations, it faced challenges in implementation. Border incidents and disputes continued to arise, particularly in the Western sector. The differing perceptions of the LAC and unresolved territorial claims remain contentious issues. The 1993 agreement is still in force today. However, there are some challenges to its implementation. One challenge is that the agreement does not define the LAC precisely. This has led to some ambiguity about where the border actually lies. Another challenge is that the agreement does not address the issue of the disputed Aksai Chin region. As the world transitioned from the Cold War era to a new global order, the year 1996 bore witness to geopolitical shifts and emerging security challenges. Nations were grappling with the aftermath of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which had given rise to new regional dynamics and threats. In this turbulent environment, many nations sought to reduce tensions and avoid the escalation of conflicts through confidence-building measures. But what exactly are confidence-building measures? In essence, CBMs are diplomatic, military, or political actions taken by states to build trust, reduce misunderstandings, and prevent unintended escalations. CBMs can take various forms, from arms control agreements to crisis communication mechanisms and transparency measures. In 1996, various regions across the globe witnessed the adoption of confidence-building measures CBMs, as a strategy to tackle distinct security issues and foster peace. Notably, India and China jointly embraced a series of CBMs aimed at averting miscommunications and diminishing the potential for armed conflicts along the line of actual control LAC. One of the most critical CBMs was the establishment of a joint working group JWG, to discuss border issues. The JWG played a vital role in building trust and facilitating dialogue between the two nations. So what was the impact of these CBMs on the ground? The measure succeeded in reducing the number of border incidents and ensuring smoother communication between India and China. 2013, the DBO standoff. One and a half decades later, on April 15th, 2013, around 40 soldiers of the People's Liberation Army of China intruded into Indian territory for about 20 kilometers in the Dulad Beg Oldi, DBO area of Ladakh. Dulad Beg Oldi, DBO, is a historic campsite which is located on the ancient trade route passing through India and Tibet. It connects Ladakh to the Tarim Basin in Xinjiang province in western China. DBO is an important military base of the Indian Army. As the vast tract of the area is uninhabited, the Chinese troops set up their tents with ease and without being noticed. When Indian patrol teams found the tents, they objected to Chinese presence on Indian soil, but the PLA soldiers refused to back off. The Indo-Tibetan border police troops were ordered to march to the site. An equal number of ITBP soldiers put up their tents some 300 meters from the Chinese troops. China kept saying that its troops were on its side of the border. India contested their claim. The diplomatic channels were opened up, and negotiators talked at length. Ministry of External Affairs officials got in touch with their Chinese counterparts. The then Indian ambassador to China S, Shashankar, visited the Chinese Foreign Office in Beijing twice. Finally, a series of flag meetings between the local commanders from the two sides took place, and after three weeks, the Beg Oldi standoff was resolved. 2013, Chumar standoff. Hours after Chinese troops pulled back from the Dulad Beg Oldi, they came back in Chumar area in Ladakh. This time, the local patrol team said that some 300 PLA troops were camping in Chumar. Chinese troops came there objecting to tin shed structures put by the Indian forces. Chinese troops said that as per the deal agreed during the last standoff, India had to dismantle the tin sheds which PLA termed as bunkers. Shumar is the last village in Ladakh area of Jammu and Kashmir bordering Himachal Pradesh. Shumar has been a bone of contention between India and China, with the latter claiming it to be its own territory. Chinese troops have been foraying into this border area with their helicopters almost every year. This time, the troops raised tents on the ground. Hectic diplomatic parlays began once again. S. Hai Shankar again played a key role in restoring the status quo. 
Chinese Premier Li Qingxiang was scheduled to visit on May 19th to India that year. In the view of his visit, diplomatic deliberations yielded results. Chinese troops dismantled their tents on May 5th, and then the Indian forces removed their tin sheds. Flag meetings were held on May 6th, and the Shumar standoff was resolved in 21 days, with China agreeing to patrolling by the Indian troops in the areas before. 2014, Demchok Standoff. Demchok's standoff began on September 10, 2014, as Indian patrol teams discovered that the Chinese troops had deployed heavy machinery to build a road inside Indian territory. Objecting to it, Indian forces moved and camped opposite Chinese troops. Demchok is located in the same Shumar area. According to the 2011 Census of India, Demchok has 31 households with a total population of 78 persons. But China claims that Demchok is part of the autonomous Tibet region. The Demchok standoff continued even when Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping signed 12 deals on September 18th. It was apparent that Modi had discussed the issue with Jinping, who was said to have shown discomfort regarding the Chinese forces' incursion. Jinping reportedly provided assurances to Modi during their talks, which subsequently led to the resolution of the Demchok standoff. But it took another week for the Chinese forces to withdraw, which followed a meeting between external affairs minister Sum Shoare and her Chinese counterpart in New York on September 26. Finally, after 20 days, PLA troops withdrew to their pre-September 10th position. 2017. Daklam Standoff The Daklam Standoff began on June 16, 2017, 10 days after Bhutan objected to Chinese road construction in the disputed area. Daklam Plateau is a disputed area between Bhutan and China. The two countries had held 24 rounds of talks for finding a resolution to border disputes in three pockets, including Daklam. After Bhutan requested the Indian Army, the troops reached the site of road construction and stopped the Chinese activity. This led to soldiers jostling with each other. They were seen pushing each other in a widely circulated video. Soon, the troops from both the sides took their positions nearly 150 meters from each other at Daklam. While China kept demanding that India must withdraw the troops unconditionally and acknowledge Chinese sovereignty over Daklam, MEA officials launched diplomatic efforts to prevent the escalation of the standoff. High-level contacts were also established, with National Security Advisor Ajit Deval holding a meeting with the Chinese President Xi Jinping during their former Beijing visit in July. With international support growing in India's favor, and the BRICS summit approaching fast, the Chinese side agreed to resolve the standoff. Both sides disengaged at Dokkum by pulling out troops. China also agreed to stop road construction, at least for the time being, in the disputed Dokkum area. Finally, after 70 days of eyeball encounter, India and Chinese troops returned to their pre-June 16 positions. 2020, the Galwan Valley Clash. The Gawan Valley Clash during the year overshadowed all previous incidents, emerging as a significantly more significant and critical development. The Gawan Valley, located in the Ladakh region of India, is a strategically significant area for both India and China. It serves as a disputed border, and tensions have been simmering for months. Tensions have been building along the line of actual control (LAC) for months, with skirmishes and face-offs becoming more frequent. Diplomatic talks were underway, but a resolution remained elusive. On the night of June 15, 2020, a violent confrontation erupted between India and Chinese troops in the Galwan Valley. It began when Indian soldiers attempted to dismantle a Chinese encampment. The battle was brutal and fierce, fought with fists, rocks, and improvised weapons. The extreme altitude and harsh terrain added to the challenges faced by both sides. The confrontation resulted in numerous casualties on both sides, with India confirming the loss of 20 soldiers in combat, while China acknowledged casualties without disclosing specific figures. Interestingly, the Russian news agency, TASS, reported a significantly higher number, stating that 45 Chinese soldiers had died. In the aftermath of the violent clash, both countries engaged in diplomatic talks and negotiations to de-escalate the situation. Eventually, a disengagement process was agreed upon, leading to the withdrawal of troops from certain flashpoints along the LAC. By August 2022, after multiple rounds of talks, the two nations met once again for their 15 rounds of talks. While there was a sense of deja vu, there was also an understanding that both sides needed to continue the dialogue. China's border disputes extended beyond India. It's worth noting that China shares its borders with 15 neighboring countries, and it might come as a surprise that it has border disputes with 14 out of those 15 neighbors. Apart from India, the most significant disputes are with Russia. China claims the Russian-controlled territory of the Argan River and the Ursuri River. Vietnam. China claims the Paracel Islands and the Spratly Islands. Japan. China claims the Senkaku Islands. Mongolia. China claims a small area of territory in the north of Mongolia. The CCP's expansion mindset is rooted in its ideology of Chinese nationalism. 
This ideology holds that China is a great power that has been humiliated by foreign powers in the past. The CCP believes that it's its mission to restore China to its rightful place as a leading power in the world. The CCP's expansionistic policies are also motivated by its desire to secure natural resources and strategic territory. China is a rapidly growing economy that requires access to natural resources such as oil, gas, and minerals. It also wants to control key strategic waterways such as the South China Sea. There is no agreement on whether China wants to expand its territory. Some people say that China's border disputes are just old problems and that China does not want to use force to solve them. Others say that China's recent actions, such as publishing a new map that includes disputed territory, show that China wants to expand. The new map is part of China's efforts to claim disputed territory. China has also increased its military presence in the South China Sea and has conducted aggressive maritime patrols. These actions have made some people worry that China is trying to expand its power in the region. It is possible that China will use the map to justify further militarization of the South China Sea. It is also possible that the map will lead to increased tensions between China and its neighbors. The future of the South China Sea remains uncertain, but the new map is a sign that China is willing to take a more assertive approach to its territorial claims. This is the chart of Japan's 10-year treasury yield. It's not cryptocurrency rising or meme stock crashing. It's way more important than all of those volatile investments. This yield gives a glimpse of Japan's economy. So it's extremely dangerous when a chart shows us the strength of a country's economy is behaving kind of like a meme stock. In yet another episode of 2022 wreaking havoc in the financial markets, what was once a world-acknowledged safe haven currency has now been turned into another desolate currency. Yes, I'm talking about the Japanese yen and how it is crashing to the ground. In what has been a constant decline this year, the Japanese yen this week fell to levels against the US dollar last seen in early 2002. While you may sit there and think that this is a problem that is, you know, exclusive to Japan, you are sadly mistaken. As much as the yen freefall creates problems for the land of the rising sun, it also creates problems in the global landscape, in particular, for the United States. How, might you ask? Well, sit tight and let me explain in extensive detail all about the crashing Japanese yen. It's one thing for a currency to face a little slump, but it's another matter entirely for it to fall to levels not seen in 20 years. That is definitely a cause for concern, especially when you consider the fact that the yen is the third most traded currency globally. At present, it is near 134 per dollar after starting in 2022 at 115. The dollar is up 16% so far this year, and we can only assume it is going to gain greater ground. All I can say is that at the moment, it seems that the yen is set for harsher waters. The question remains, however, what is causing such a weak yen? Well, the weakness primarily stems from widening interest rate differentials between Japan and elsewhere. The gap between the interest rates charged globally and those in Japan is becoming astronomical. What do I mean? Well, let me explain. You see, due to various inflation rates in different countries, most global powers led by the US Federal Reserve have been raising rates aggressively to tame soaring inflation. But Japan has not. This is because Japan barely has any inflation to speak of, and so the Bank of Japan has doubled down on its easy policy stance. As an effect, the gap between the Japanese 10-year government bond yields and those in the United States is 279 basis points. This is simply astronomical. To add to this, the Federal Reserve is set to boost interest rates by 0.5% points at its next meeting and is on track for 3% rates by the end of this year. This means that the gap will only get wider. Craig Botham, an economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics said, the Bank of Japan stood firm once again, leaving rates unchanged and even doubling down on yield curve control, signaling a commitment to easing despite the plight of the yen. All these actions put the Bank of Japan in an unenviable position. You see, the central bank held rates and pledged to cap the 10-year government bond yield at 0.25%. This rate is nothing compared to what the US is offering, 
and so this news only triggered a further slide in the yen. So what does the drop in the yen mean for other markets and the US specifically? Let's get into it. Well, when it comes to the effects that we're seeing and what we shall see, it's safe to say that it's kind of a mixed bag. On one hand, the yen has long been the currency of choice for investors undertaking so-called carry trades. This involves borrowing in a low yielding currency like the yen to invest in higher yielding currencies like US or Canadian dollars. So at its capped 0.25% yield, the yen has been perfect for this strategy. Many people borrow in yen and invest in equal baskets of US, Australian, and Canadian dollars. In these first few months of the year, those who did this would have yielded just over 13%, according to Refinitiv data. That is some significant gain, especially at scale. When it comes to the direct effects on the United States, it gets pretty interesting. The Federal Reserve is set to begin winding down its extensive bond buying program around this time this year. In an interesting turn of events, the central bank is counting on investors like Japanese institutions, the biggest foreign buyers of US treasuries, to step in and help absorb the increased supply of treasuries on the market. However, at the current price, this might not happen as fluidly as expected. This is because the yen's route might cut into Japanese demand for treasuries. How, might you ask? Well, allow me to enlighten you. You see, as the yen weakens, Japanese investors with dollar-denominated assets will have to pay more to hedge against the risk of currency fluctuations cutting into their returns. Theoretically, the generous US yields should make treasuries still attractive to Japanese investors. The 10-year US Treasury has a yield of 2.9%, while the 10-year Japanese government bond has a comparatively paltry yield of 0.25%. However, the caveat is that hedging has gotten so expensive that the extra yield a Japanese investor would get from holding treasuries instead of Japanese government bonds has almost disappeared. Also, after you factor in the cost of taking out currency protection, the difference between the 10-year treasury yield and the 10-year Japanese government bond yield is just 0.2 percentage points. This is according to an analysis done by Goldman Sachs Group. Effectively, what this means is that the advantage that is supposedly to be had by investing in the US is lost. Daisuke Karakama, the chief market economist at Mizuho Bank, has commented that he thinks that due to a fear of the unwinding of the weak Japanese yen and pricey US stocks, Japanese institutions are likely to focus their portfolios more on ultra-long-term Japanese government bonds instead of US assets. Data shows that Japanese investors have been trimming their foreign bond holdings. According to the Wall Street Journal, they have been net sellers of foreign bonds in all but one month since November, as stated by the Japanese Ministry of Finance, selling a net 2.36 trillion yen, or the equivalent of $18.4 billion in overseas bonds just last month. If the pullback in bond buying continues, it will be coming at a very inopportune time for their US counterparts, given that bond investors have already taken sharp losses this year. And it is not a stretch to say that the selling of bonds ripples to other markets, in particular, our stock market. This is something investors saw happen in the first few months of 2021. Japanese banks, insurers, and other institutions dumped tens of billions of dollars of US bond holdings ahead of the end of their fiscal years, exacerbating a sharp rise in bond yields, especially during Asian trading hours. And the US stocks tumbled. For those Japanese investors that have risk tolerance and decided to stay in the treasuries market, they might bypass higher hedging costs by foregoing taking up protection against currency fluctuations. This, however, is not, you know, without consequences. Were the yen to recover and abruptly rally against the dollar, one's yield advantage could completely erode in like a few days. This is part of what is making investors uneasy. The speed of the yen's drop and questions about policymaker interventions makes the case much more unpredictable than it's supposed to be. This brings us to a question. With things this bad, the question becomes, is the Japanese government not seeing what's happening? Are they going to take a back seat to all of this?
What should we be paying attention to with weak yen? What do we got to focus on? We, we still have to focus on uh, what the central banks are going to do, especially what the BOJ is going to do over the next few weeks. They have a, a meeting coming up in a few weeks. And uh, we think that they're going to um, potentially raise that cap on 10-year JGB really? yields. Yes. You're willing to call that, that they're going to go from a 0.25 out to something new? There's going to be a, a, a loss or a, or a lack of tolerance for, for a weaker yen. As you said, imports are going to start getting more expensive in Japan. Right. Uh, it's true that they need more inflation, but it seems that they also right. don't need the kind of uncertainty that's brought to the market by a lot of dollar yen volatility. Okay, but two, and we're talking about a cultural change in Japan. Are we gonna see that at this time? No, I wouldn't describe it as such. To, to say it's a cultural change would be to say that somehow 0.25% is some sort of line in the sand that is immutable. Uh, it was in, always intended to adjust with conditions. Uh, inflation is returning to Japan to some extent, but more importantly, this, the BOJ risks having a situation where it's forced to absorb and buy every JGB on the planet. And the adjustment they have to make here is to raise the cap. It's not a cultural change. I think it's what central banks do all the time. Uh, move with the times, move with the data. It is highly unlikely that the relevant authorities will stay put as the yen falls. The Japanese government and the central bank are already on record after having said that they were concerned by the recent sharp falls. That, my friends, is the strongest warning to date that Tokyo could intervene. However, despite the fact that the yen is falling, there's a good chance that the authorities will not intervene. Given the economy's reliance on exports, Japan has historically focused on arresting sharp yen rises and taking a hands-off approach to yen weakness which is more difficult because yen buying requires Japan to draw on limited foreign reserves. Even its history shows a hands-free approach. The last time Japan intervened to support its currency was in 1998, when the Asian financial crisis triggered rapid capital outflows from the region. Before that, Tokyo intervened to counter yen falls in 91 through 92. As you can see, these are special periods and extremes. To depend on them and use them as the rule and not the exception would be foolish. When the government intervenes in such matters, it is a costly endeavor, one they might not want to bear. Also, there's a good chance that they might still fail to influence the yen's value, so that would be a double and deeper loss. It's also prudent to ask ourselves another important question. Is the yen falling entirely bad for the Japanese economy? Or does the government know what it's doing when it maintains a hands-off approach? Surprisingly, some benefits come from Japan having a weak yen. Comparatively, the yen has weakened back towards recent seven-year lows versus the Chinese yuan. It's also hitting a new multi-year low against the Korean won and the Taiwanese dollar, which should provide some relief for Japan's widening trade deficit. The cheaper the yen, the better it is for trade. Some people, like John Vail, chief global strategist at Nikko Asset Management, says currency weakness is crucial for Japan's economy to maintain its competitiveness as a secure source of supply chain diversification. The yen's decline also boosts the attractiveness of its stock market among foreign investors, who consider it undervalued versus European and US markets. Japanese stocks have outperformed rivals in 2022 although they are still down as investors globally dump riskier assets. So perhaps the last question that arises is, benefits aside, and if the government isn't going to intervene, what could stop the yen from free-falling? Well, it's a little hard to say, but a marked improvement in growth prospects as the country reopens its borders post-COVID and higher inflation could alter the Bank of Japan's dovish stance. Japan's core consumer prices in April were 2.1% higher than a year earlier, exceeding the Bank of Japan's 2% inflation target for the first time in seven years. Francesca Fornasari, head of currency solutions at Insight Investments, has said that the yen's fall could stop if the Bank of Japan changes tack and becomes hawkish. This is something we already discussed earlier in the video. Any sign that rates outside of Japan are peaking might also prompt a relief rally.
There are no signs of that yet though, with US rates set to peak at 3.5% in mid 2023, according to future markets. I suppose like many other things in 2022, we shall have to wait and see what comes next. The Japanese situation goes to show one thing though, there is myriad factors that go into currencies and economies. As is, the US might be affected by something that is happening outside its borders in the land of the rising sun to be exact. Whether the yen will keep falling, affecting the global financial landscape, or whether it will rise, shocking traders, is something yet to be seen. Either way, you can be sure that Japan's demise or recovery will be well documented here for you to know about.